for the Fast Lane, Cardinals Hall of Famer and fifth member, Matt Holiday. We're hanging with Holiday on 101 ESPN. Powered by Air Alliance Team Heating and Cooling. Getting the job done quickly, correctly, 100% of the time. Let's get nasty here on a Thursday afternoon. Jamie Rivers here in the fast lane with Tanner Hendrickson, Andrew Marsh on the dials. And we go immediately out to our celebrity line to be joined by Cardinals Hall of Famer, Matt Holiday. Matt, how we doing, buddy? What's up, guys? How we doing? We're good. We're good. We're kind of flying the plane solo here. So who knows what the hell's going to happen? But we're having a good time. <laughs> Hey, congratulations on uh, doing the Blues games I saw. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I'm, I'm really excited for the opportunity, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be good to get back out there. And it, The best part about it is I was actually talking to some of the players today is I get to pretend I'm back in the NHL, but I actually there don't have go. to play. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about doing good or bad. You can just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't have any results don't matter. Or getting punched in the face. Yeah, you know, although you, you oh never yeah, know. I forgot that was part of your deal. Sometimes yeah, it's in play though. Better. You never know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right. Hey, look, I always love talking to you about your boys. And um if I feel like every single time after we talk there's something new that kind of pops up and Tanner and I were were talking in the office before just you know, Jack, highlighting Jackson again, his trajectory is off the charts right now. At 19 years old, playing double-A ball, his numbers are fantastic. Um, as far as you're concerned, you know, as a dad and as a baseball guy, does a call-up to triple-A kind of seem imminent at this point for this season? Well, I'm not sure about, um, you know, a lot of times, Jamie, and, and the different organizations uh, treat it differently, but a lot of times triple-A and double-A um, – there's not a, a, a ton of difference in, in quality of 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 of, uh, of play, so I, I think they might may end up just leaving him and letting him finish out Double A. Um, you know, I think there's about a month left of the minor league season. Uh, I think at the end there's potential. Uh, I know the Triple A team is is qualified for the playoffs, and they'll probably take a few of their players off of the Triple A roster uh, once September 1st hit. So I do think it, it you know at the end of the season. He could possibly uh, go up and play in the playoffs with the AAA team. Um, but I, I, I think they, they like the idea of, of him being in AA for a while. And um, You're right. He's, he's played really, really well. So I'm, I'm really proud of him. He's, um, you know, for a, a kid to go from, you know, having never played probably more than, I don't know, like, I guess they probably play 60 to 75 games, including high school and summer ball to, you know, he's right around the 100, 100 game mark and, and was still a month to go. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a daunting task for, for a 19-year-old to, to figure this out and to kind of manage his body and manage all the things that goes into being a professional. So uh, he's handled it really well, and, and uh, he's obviously uh, played really well. And, and for him, his goal was to get to double-A this year, and, and he's done that, and he's doing good. So, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the way he, he, he works. And, and I get a lot of nice messages from people in the organization that talk about what an example he sets and, and what a good teammate he is. And those things mean more, more than anything, really, as you know, you know, the character of your kids is the thing you worry about most. And uh, he is a, he's a great kid. Well, another thing that's going to happen here too, is he's going to become the fountain of knowledge for his younger brother. Because mm -hmm. uh, after we talked last week, as I was perusing the interwebs, uh, I saw Ethan holiday with one of the smoothest baseball swings I've seen in a while and he's, you know, what is he, the top-rated player for the 2025 high school draft right now? Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's ranked, he's ranked first in, in a lot of the publications for his class. And uh, went down to Dallas last weekend and played with the group that was older. Uh, he and another kid got invited to the 2024 All-Star Game at, at uh, the Rangers Stadium and went down there and had a great weekend. He played really well and, and uh, hit the ball really well and won the MVP of the game and worked out, you know, for the scouts and, and did really well. So he's... He's extremely talented. Uh, he's uh, he's a great kid. Again, I'm most worried about their their hearts and their you know their character, and, and I'm really proud of them, you know who they are as people. But he's got a ton of baseball talent, and and uh, really looks up to Jackson and what Jackson's been able to do. So um, it's it's fun. I mean, as you know, having a shared shared passion with your kids and um, is is something that I uh, I really enjoy. And so getting a chance to go down to Dallas and watch him do his thing and. Um, he does have a really smooth swing. I mean, he's he's a really talented player and, and uh, should be fun to watch his career unfold. 
Well, one thing that happened for me growing up is I had an older brother, four years older than me. He ended up making the NHL before I did. Now, he, he just had a cup of coffee in the NHL, but one thing he was able to do is continue to pass on knowledge about the next level, the next step, what to expect, almost like your own personal little scouting staff. Yeah. Do your boys exchange information like that? Yeah, they talk all the time. They're really close, and, and uh, Jackson's a big – he loves to encourage Ethan, and he's always asking me. I'll call him at night to talk to him, and he's like, how'd Ethan do? How's Ethan doing? What's he doing? I'm like, just call him. Uh, but he, he really is, is – uh, you know, they, they talk a lot, and they – um, they talk baseball, they talk hitting. Um, so they're, they're really, really close, uh, which I love. And, and, uh, so it's, it is an advantage that, uh, will we'll, you know, ultimately it will be a really good advantage for Ethan to have Jackson a few steps ahead of him, uh, on this baseball, uh, ladder, so to speak. So, um, it's, it's a great advantage as, as I'm sure you knew, um, to, to that comfort level of having somebody like Jackson to be able to help Ethan, uh, you know, as he moves moves along in his career is, is something that's invaluable. Matt, Tanner Hendrickson here. Jackson, I will, going back to him real quick, do you think there's a chance that he goes to the Arizona Fall League this year? And correct me if I'm wrong, you did that when you were coming up through the minor leagues as well. Yeah, I played in the Arizona Fall League actually twice. So um, I'm not sure what they'll do with him this winter. I, I think if he finishes strong and, um, you know, even maybe finishes in the playoffs with AAA or has some, some games that, that lead into to, to mid to late September. Uh, I think they might just let him train this off season. Uh, you know, for, like I said earlier, for a young kid uh, to get 120, 140 games uh, under his belt, I, I think is a lot. And so uh, I'm not sure. I haven't heard what the plan is concerning the fall league or if they would want him to participate in that, but I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great, a uh, month and a half in, in Arizona to, to play some baseball and learn and keep keep uh, keep honing your craft. But um, I think by the time we get to that point, uh, he may have played, you know, like I said, a lot of games, and, and it might be best uh, for him to get back in the weight room and try to put a little bit of weight on this off season heading into next year. I was just going to ask, what what is it like to play in the Arizona Fall League? Because that's where teams send some of their top prospects, some of their top pitching arms, where in a minor league series, you may only see one of their top prospects, and you may get some other guys that just aren't in the top 30 when they're looking at it. What's it like to play in the Arizona Fall League? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's obviously a good challenge. Um, but I think, you know, Tanner, one of the things that you're seeing, and I, I don't I don't have the data in front of me to back this up, but a lot of these these teams are protecting their pitching prospects. And if they played a full season, you know, they're not sending as many of their sort of on the cusp of the big league prospects uh, to the Arizona Fall League in the last few years. From, from what, this is just me kind of, you know, taking a, a, a small look at it. But um, I do think it is a great challenge to, to go to the Arizona Fall League and, and play um, more games against great, great competition. But um, it seems like lately a lot of these teams are, are uh, protecting their prospects and maybe – uh, if they meet their innings limit during the season, uh, you're seeing more of a, a second tier, uh, maybe a younger type of prospect than, than those double-A guys that are right on the cusp of breaking into the big leagues, which has is, is sort of been what the Arizona Fall League is known for. Talking again here with Matt Holiday, Cardinals Hall of Famer. Uh, Matt, when we, we look at some of these young guys, specifically Jordan Walker, we talked about this, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, just there are some struggles, or we'll call them speed bumps in the outfield when it comes to defending. And Tanner brought this up to me, so I'm not going to take credit for this, but you were a third baseman, and then you went from third base to the outfield. How hard was that for you? And what adjustments did you have to make? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's all about repetition. You know, I think that you just can't, you know, you can take all the, all the fly balls off of fungos, um, you know, in the world, but, uh, you know, replicating uh, in-game uh, repetitions and, and seeing the ball off the bat of, of hitters at a live action and, and how it moves. And, um, you know, you, you, it's, it's just one of those things that it takes a little while to adjust. And I think Jordan will get better and better because he's a good athlete and, and things will come easier and easier for him the more in, in game action that he gets and sees. Um, so it, it is an adjustment. I mean, obviously you go from the infield where, you know, you, you're not catching a lot of fly balls to, you know, you're, you know, at the, at the major league level, the hard balls are the, the ones that are right at you on a line drive and trying to get a good read, whether it's going back or coming in. And then sort of the tailing balls from a righty or a lefty that are kind of over your head and, and slicing or cutting. Um, so those are the balls that you can't really get off of a fungo. 
um, that, you, that you know, you just need time in the outfield. And I think that's one good thing about Jordan the rest of this year when maybe the Cardinals aren't in the middle of the playoff race, that uh, the pressure to, to catch every, you know, ball and, and uh, you know, he'll get a chance to, to get experience out there without the pressure of, of the playoff spot or a playoff, you know, uh, you know, on the, on the line. Um, but I, I think that it's good for him. I think he's only you know 21 years old or 22, whatever he is. And um, I think ultimately he'll be just fine uh, as a, as a big league right fielder or left fielder, depending on where they decide they want to play him. Man, I know every player is different, but how long did it take you to feel really comfortable in the outfield? Because it is a tough transition to go from the dirt to the outfield. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, like I said, it's a, it, it takes a while of, of game activity and just getting that that bulk of, of action out in the outfield to where you're comfortable with, with those particular balls that I talked about and, and going back on the ball, and, you know, feeling for the fence and and just all the, you know, the, the, the angles and all that stuff. So uh, you, you practice it, you work on it, but ultimately you, you need game action and, and it takes a little while. But I, I think next year you'll see, You'll see a market improvement um, and in his outfield defense, and, and uh, I don't think it'll be it'll be quite the conversation topic uh, that it has been. Matt, we got a guy coming on here tomorrow to to come in, I guess, out of the bullpen. We'll say uh, with Anthony out of town, Tanner won't be here. Uh, Josh Outman is joining us for a couple hours oh, wow. tomorrow. I know you guys were in the A's organization together. Mm-hmm. What uh, what do you remember about Josh? What can we expect from this guy? Has he got some personality or what? <laughs> I haven't talked to Josh in a long time. I mean, I guess that was probably 2009. <laughs> um, but I, I remember he was up with us. I, I don't know if he was there the whole year, but he was. Uh, he had the he had the high socks. I remember he was. Uh, he had some personality, so I'm sure uh, he's a left-handed pitcher. So I'm sure there, there's probably some quirkiness and some left-hand pitcher to him. So. Uh, that, that, that's exciting for him. But, uh, yeah, I, I do remember playing with Josh for, for that little time uh, period in, in Oakland. But uh, I do remember he had the high socks with the high stirrups and, and threw pretty hard. So um, I'll have to tune in and check him out. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, look, we'll, uh, we'll give him a test drive here tomorrow in the fast lane, see if he, you know, <laughs> f- see if he fits the bill here for us. We, we drive a hard ship here. That's true. That's true. You're probably tough to work with. <laughs> yeah, extremely tough. Matt, I appreciate you coming on, man. As always, I absolutely love talking about your boys and, and their path to the big league. So I appreciate you uh, bringing us uh, behind the curtain there a little bit as to how great their relationship is and, and their success that they're having right now. So thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And uh, have a good show. We'll All talk right. to you guys next week. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Okay. See you guys. See you later. That was uh, Cardinals Hall of Famer outfielder Matt Holiday joining us. Uh, some great stuff, T Bone. I just love Matt Holiday. He's great. You he, talk to him forever. Yeah, we should. We should have just kind of kept pushing. The I line. know, but I didn't ask him, right? So I didn't want to be that guy. Also, just like, hey, by the way, we're keeping you for another ten minutes. Like, my name's not we're, BK. We're, we're never going to break. I'm not BK. Okay. Yeah, well, that's true. BK would do that. That's a good point. All right, Matthew Libertor, uh, eh, so-so outing again last night. For the Cardinals, did he show us who he really is? Eh, we'll get into that next year in the Fast Lane on 101 ESPN.
Uh, didn't get ahead as much, wasn't in the zone as much, didn't land the curveball as much. And then a decent amount of pitches in the first, you're going to feel that as you get deeper into that game in every aspect from a fatigue, velo, all of that standpoint. But it's just uh, part of development. If you're going to develop at this level, you're going to have ups and downs, and we go right back to work and see what the next outing looks like. Welcome back inside the Fast Lane 101 ESPN. That was uh, Cardinals manager Ollie Marmel following the game last night discussing Matthew Libertor. And I think, guys, the biggest question we had before the game last night was, man, was that version of Matthew Libertor the real deal against the Rays that we saw? Because if it is, whew, this is going to be the Matthew Libertor trade. Some would say we would have won the Rose, Rose Rain trade. Mm-hmm. They'd say, Randy, who? Exactly. Yeah. Well, they're not right now uh, because Matthew Libertor uh, went four point four four and a third last night. Ten hits, five earned runs, three walks, five Ks. Tanner was just kind of all over the place. That guy he sucks. Didn't. Oh, Anthony. Oh, oh. Welcome back, Anthony, from um, Great Wolf Lodge. That was Anthony. He uh, piping in there. Even on vacation, he's kind of negative. Uh, you know what? He's uh, he's passionate. He's passionate, but not great. You know, I respect that about him, though. Not great. No. Tanner. No. I mean, it was a loaded line T-bone. he was going against. No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. It, it was, was a, a triple It was Marshy's lineup. softball team out there last night. No <laughs> and we dis- came in second place this no season. No disrespect to you and Don Kuhn. No disrespect to your <laughs> softball team. What the hell is that? It's my Christmas light guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my Christmas light guy played on Marshy's <laughs> softball team. He's <laughs> a hell of a guy. Great guy. He, he is, uh, he is, is a he a good player? Yeah, yeah, he is. You better say that. Eh? Yeah. yeah, good third baseman. He's our third baseman. Oh, he plays the hot corner. Oh yeah. Wow. Which is which is huge in softball. Oh, we get a lot of balls yeah. here. Shortstop Absolutely. and third base. Left field too. Very important. Uh, no, not so much. Oh no. No. Actually, it's very important. I'm uh-huh. joking. I just want to play with Tanner. Why you got to do? I got, I got I got put in right field last time I played the softball. So game. that that begs the question. Like, uh, Did they have you bring a glove or not? Yeah. You know. Are you a good baseball player, Tanner? No. 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 No, I uh, I peaked in middle school, so it's about all I can say. If, and when I mean peak, I still couldn't hit. Okay, because I was just about to ask you, if we put you in the home run derby next year, can we count on any dingers? I'll say yes, just because I still think I could at least pop one, unlike BK and Ferrario. Yeah. I mean, Ferrario, like, brags about hitting the wall. Sure, whatever. Yeah, but it rolled there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to Matthew Libertor. Last night, again, only four and a third innings pitched, uh, erratic. Uh, the first inning was anything Ooh. but a Picasso. Uh, what do the Cardinals do here? Like, what do you, I guess if you're a scout, let's pretend, let's, we're not Cardinals fans right now. Let's pretend we're scouts. Okay. Not like really good scouts. We're okay, just yeah. scouts. And we're watching Matthew Libertor. His first game against the Brewers, he comes up and shoves Okay, great. But then between then and all of in the Tampa Bay game, tough, tough to watch. Then last night, you're hoping that this young man has gotten some traction and he's able to put a couple of games together. It didn't happen, T-Bone. Now, last night felt like one of those where there was that step forward, the Tampa Bay Rays game, and then two steps back last night is what that outing kind of felt like because it was a lot of the same issues that we'd seen before that the Cardinals have talked about where the velo really start, it starts up in the 94 range where it's like, hey, can he hold his fastball velo? And then it drops back down. Like I'm looking at his last inning last night in his fastball slash sinker sitting around 91, 90. So his velo dropped again. And that was the thing that was great about the race start was he was able to maintain his velo. And then because he had that velo with the fastball, the fastball had more life to it. He's able to command it back. Better, and then he's able to use that to play up his curveball. And last night didn't have the curveball, and then the velo really started to drop. It just felt like two steps back for Matthew Libertor. Now, what that means for the plan moving forward, he's still going to be a guy that's in the rotation for the Cardinals because yeah. why not? You got nothing to lose at this point. Let's see what Matthew Libertor is. Let's see if let's see if he he said last night post game. You know, some of my bad habits reemerged. Maybe that was because of that first inning where he kind of got blindsided by the Oakland A's. Maybe he, if it's a good thing that he knows what the bad habits were and that they came back, maybe he sees that, makes the adjustment. We'll see what he looks like at his next start. But yeah, last night definitely felt like two steps back because he just couldn't maintain the velo. Yeah, you're right. Like if a player after a game, uh, after a bad outing, specifically a pitcher, is Eric shrugging his shoulders, being like, I don't really know what happened. That's when you kind of worry a little bit. The fact that, the fact that Matthew Libertor kind of identified some things, it doesn't make it better or it doesn't make it great. But yeah. at least I know he's able to understand when things are going well. We get a text here 
By the way, the Air Comfort Service text line is always open. Text us at any point, 314-399-9646. And this one here is from the 636. It says, it's a young guy in development. Giving up on him would be the same as trading Randy A. early. Nobody's given up on Matthew Libertor. I'm not giving up on Matthew Libertor. Was he 23, 24 years old? Something like that. I don't think he's that old. He, he's younger than Gorman, and they were like high school teammates. I think he's 22. Let's see here. So in way, either way. 23. 23, okay. So we're not giving up on Matthew Libertor. What we're saying that right now is that he's not consistent. He can't bring that every day. He can't bring that start every five days that you expect out of a guy. Now, the fact that the Cardinals are out of it, yeah, this is the benefit of being able to develop a guy at the major league level. At some point, does it become counterproductive this year? I don't know. Because if he goes down to AAA and he pitches the same way, is he really learning anything? No. no. I think it's better to be up here with all the top-notch uh, coaches, with the technology, with all his pitching partners. Because you know Wayno's talking to him. You know that whoever's there in the dugout is talking to this guy. The next day, the off day, they're talking to him. Miles Michaelis talking to him. Like, this is, uh, we've heard from Adam Wayne right before and other pitchers. BT's talked about it too. It's like a little small fraternity where they're all there helping each other out. They're watching each other's bullpen sessions. So I'm, uh, me personally, I'm far from giving up on Matthew Libertor, but I'm also a realist in saying there's a lot of ways to go here. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm not giving up on Matthew Libertor, but there are definitely a lot of steps that need to be taken that you need to start seeing from Matthew Libertor because, yes, he is young, and yes, I don't think you trade him, mostly because I think his value is too low at this point. It's it's not the Randy Rosarain situation because Randy Rosarain didn't get opportunities. Matthew Libertor's getting opportunities. I mean, he's up to 50 innings now this year and 11 starts, and he's got a 6.12 ERA. And the same issues are reoccurring that occurred not just this year but last year, where he can't maintain the velo. Now they're trying to come up with a plan to try and help that. But to your point too, he's got nothing left to prove in AAA. 3.72 ERA in 11 starts, like that's the guy you're hoping you're going to get at the major league level. So where's the disconnect to why it's not translating from Memphis to here in St. Louis. I think it's because one, it's definitely better hitters that he's facing. So when you see that drop in velo and then he can't use the curveball as much to play off of the fastball, you can get away with that at the triple A level. Why? Because those aren't big leaguers. Here at the major league level, you're not going to get away with that. So I, I'm not giving up on him, but I am starting to get a little bit concerned that we aren't seeing the right steps for him. You know, we did see the one against Tampa Bay. But right now, that just looks more like a blip on the radar than it does anything else. But I, I can yeah. see where you can dream on that, though. Do you, is it a blip on the radar, or is it like, okay, this is what he's capable of? I, I don't think I can say that this is what he's capable of unless he can repeat it at least once or twice more. Because to me— it's, So his, his outing against the Brewers, although albeit it was a long time ago— in a galaxy far, far away? It was. But then when you see that outing, then you see the Tampa outing, like— is it a blip on the radar still, or is it potential that he has where you're like, okay, he can get to this level, but man, it takes time between starts, like between good starts. Yes, I, I guess. I guess. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I am, I'm positive or reassured about Matthew Libertor, knowing he can at least hit a certain level of pitching. If I've got a guy who can't even hit that level, now we got problems. Yeah, I. I understand what you're saying, and I, I I can agree with it to a certain point of, yes, it's nice to see that he has been able to do it at least once or twice, but the fact that it continues, this is, so it's a different position. It's a position player compared to a pitcher, and maybe my thought process on position players should be different compared to a pitcher, but like when I look at Nolan Gorman last year, Gorman comes up, has that really hot start, and then he goes really cold. And then he gets hot again near the end. And he, and he, you hear him say, making the adjustments of, oh, he went from a leg kick to a toe tap. And he's making the adjustments at the plate. The problem for Matthew Libertor is I continue to hear what he's doing wrong, but I'm not seeing the adjustments being made, if that makes sense. Like, I, I understand the – and this is why we've got Leo Mazzoni coming up at 3 o'clock, by the way, I, the former pitching coach of the Braves. This is why I'm interested to ask him, like, would you have a guy that is having trouble maintaining velo – like Matthew Libertor is, is that something that can be fixed in a regular season, during the season? Or is that an off-season thing where it is he's got to have a better workout regimen, not a better workout, but a workout regimen built for that mm -hmm. to help him maintain that? Because if it's something he can't fix in the regular season, and it's just kind of one of those where it's like, okay, maybe he can do it once against the Tampa Bay Rays, 
then okay, then I need to change my evaluation process of, okay, he can't make that adjustment right now because he needs an off season to be able to make that adjustment. But my concern with Libertor is I'm just not seeing the constant adjustments to the major league level. I see a guy that goes out there and it seems like the same thing over and over and over again where I see the same problems and not enough adjustment. I, I hope that makes sense because that's how I judged. That's why I was so high on Gorman coming into this year. I saw Gorman go through the lows of lows last year. But I also saw the highs, and I saw the adjustment to help him get to that point. And I just haven't seen those adjustments for Matthew Libertor through a consistent basis. He's Tanner Hendrickson. I'm Jamie Rivers. Andrew Marsh on the dials. We talked to our good buddy Jeremy Rutherford yesterday, and one of the things we asked him about the Blues was which player either needs to step up or has to have a bounce-back year for the Blues. We'll hear what JR had to say, and then we have some thoughts of our own. Right here on 101 ESPN.
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Andrew Marsh. It's time for a Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The cards fall to the A's yesterday by a final score of eight to nothing. Matthew Libertor went four and a third, gave up ten hits, five earned runs. He walked three. Adam Wainwright will be on the mound tonight, going for win 199. He will face former Cardinal Jose Quintana and the New York Mets, 615. You can find that on Fox. We'll have Leo Mazzoni joining us later today. We also talked with Matt Holiday earlier in the show. If you missed that interview, make sure you go to 101ESPN.com or check out the 101 mobile app. It's all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. Which player needs to step up or have a bounce back year for the Blues? We're going to discuss that next right here in the Fast Lane. I'm Andrew Marsh, and the Sports Center update is driven by Johnny Londoff. Find new roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Welcome back inside the fast lane. It's 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers here, Tanner Hendrickson, Andrew Marsh on the dials. Our guy, Anthony, a little vacay with the family before school starts. So Stalter family vacation. Hope they're having a great time. Uh, Get some rest. I doubt it. (laughs) He's got three kids. This is not a vacation. I was going to say, how much rest are we going to like? Not a lot. And I know where he's going. There's no rest involved. (laughs) Good luck, Anthony. We love you. We miss you. Wouldn't be like a T-bone vacation where I could sleep in all day. Just kick the legs up? Yeah, go to a beach. What does a T-bone vacation look like? It is. Take us inside a T-bone vacation for a second. It is going to... A beach somewhere, probably in Florida. Big Florida okay, guy. So like, and just hanging like on the beach all warm, day. Warm, but not like tropical. Like yeah, not like yeah, not no. like Jamaica. No, no. Most of I probably couldn't afford Jamaica, but I can afford Let's going pretend. down to Florida. Let's just pretend. You have, you oh, have if money. I could, yeah, I would go to Costa Rica. Would be where mm. I would go. Have you I've been always, there before? No, I've always wanted to go to Costa Rica. Okay. I don't know why. I think it's since I watched a video about it in Spanish class. Oh but yeah. But I, I want to go hang out on the beach all day. Just drink a couple beers. Sit out there. And let just life pa- pass me by. Oh boy! Wow. All right, yeah. Marshy, where's your spot? Uh, I've never been to Europe before. I feel like making a trip over there would be pretty cool. But I'm also should try to get on on Curb's trip. Curb's oh, is over London? in London. Yeah. I don't know if I want to go to London though. I was thinking somewhere else. I don't, I don't know. But um, what was that? No, nothing. It's uh, we're listening to you. Oh, uh, I think uh, my brother gave me a solid recommendation of going to uh, Aruba. So maybe I take him up on that and, and go to Aruba. Jamaica. Ooh, Ooh I, I want to take, take it to Bermuda, Bahama. Come on, pretty mama. Anyway, right. was he like singing that when he recommended it? I don't think so. Oh. All right. Before we get into the blues, the Cardinals have some roster moves today. Uh, the Cardinals recall utility player. Imagine that, Tanner, another utility player. Can never have enough, No, Jamie. you sure can I think we even said that yesterday, My if goodness. I remember correctly. They call up uh, Richie Palacios from AAA. That's the guy that we got from the Guardians. Yep, it it's is. It's about time he made his debut. AAA Memphis and place second baseman Nolan Gorman on the IL with lower back strain. Ooh. So I don't know if there's more to come, uh, if that's the only roster move, but that's what we've got so far. All mm. right, let's get back into the blues here. Uh, JR was on here yesterday. We asked him to kind of go into detail. So this is, is a little bit of a lengthy listen, but pay attention to it. We asked him who needs a bounce back year for the Blues. Here's what JR had to say. You know, there, there was some criticism of Jordan Cairo, but obviously he had some great numbers. You hope for some more consistency uh, from him. But the guys I'll look at are some of the veterans. I, I think you got to look at uh, Brandon Saad. He's got to be more consistent. He's got to con- contribute more, especially as one of those uh, leaders on this team. You know, I think uh, a Braden Chen at times, even though I felt like he had a pretty decent uh, stretches of, of time last year, I think he can be better and has to be, especially with Ryan O'Reilly gone. And then you look back at that uh, defensive core, and I think that's where a lot of the finger pointing has been, and probably rightly so. But, you know, Tory Krug, after invoking his no-trade clause, he's going to be back. He's got to be better. Colton Pareko, uh, Nick Letty, those are the three that come to mind. Falk was good at times, but not the whole year. Uh, so I think I'm looking at the veterans. Yeah, some of these younger players you'd like to see more, uh, including a Kyrou Thomas, 
Uh, but to me, these veterans have to lead them through this repo. All right, that was our guy, JR. And, he, you know, he, it's never a great thing, by the way, when there's more than, like, one or two guys <laughs> that get mentioned. I think what it does is it gives you – it gives you a really good idea as to why things went south last year for the Blues. And the best thing about it, Tanner, is we've talked about this before, and I've said it. I fully anticipate the decor to be better. I fully anticipate them to play like they're, they're capable of, or at least a version of it. And if they do, that's a better team right away. Right away. So we look at, if we isolate the decor, who's the one guy? Who's one guy for you back there that has to have a bounce back season and why? For the decor for me, it's Pareko. Because I, I think he, he's going to be the guy that's going to be kind of that shutdown pairing with Nick Letty. And last year, there were times where, for I would say most of the year, Pareko just didn't look right. Had trouble getting pucks out of his zone. Wasn't playing up to the potential that the Blues have talked about. I, I really think he's been kind of disappointing since... Petro left and being the alpha dog is what he was kind well, of that's deemed. part of the problem and, and I and I, that is true and that is fair I believe too because I I think that was kind of one of those where it was like too much of a pressure put on Colton Prey go to mm -hmm. oh, go be Alex Petrangelo yeah. um There's so only one of those I, I yeah I I think uh I I think for him it's about bouncing back and looking more like we did in the kind of back portion of the season because down the last stretch there after the trade deadline and maybe this is part of it too his name was circulating in trade rumors at that time after the trade deadline i thought preko looked great looked like the guy that you kind of expected him to be using that length to help break up plays when it came to the defensive zone getting pucks out of the zone using his uh, skating ability to get out of the zone i think if i can pick one defenseman i would pick him because he's going to be the guy that's going to be getting a lot of those defensive zone draws the krug and falk pairing like look having krug bounce back would be great because it helps the power play too and helps offensively but I don't know if you're going to have as much. I don't think you're going to have any issues offensively. I think this team's going to be really good offensively. Defense is the concern. So who's the guy that I circle as the defensive guy on the defensive side? It would be Colton Preco for me. Okay, so a couple of things that you said there that uh, grabbed my attention. One, uh, I like your pick, Colton Preco. Look, there. Quite honestly, there's no wrong answer because all of the defensemen yeah. should have played better and were are looking for a bounce back season. So there's no wrong answer. Here's where. I differ in opinion. You said after the trade deadline, he picked it up and he played much better. He did, which is why he's not my bounce back player. There's another individual that just did not have that spike, that uptick in play. Tory Krug. When I look at Tory Krug last year, it wasn't a great year for Tory Krug. Uh, he ended up with 32 points in 63 games, spent time on the injured list. The power play was not good for the Blues. And when you're a guy that's brought in specifically to quarterback a power play, which the, his resume is what it is, meaning he's one of the best power play defensemen in the NHL for the last decade. I mean, that's impressive, but it wasn't there last year. It wasn't there from the beginning to the end. There were patches of okay hockey, but defensively he struggled too, leading us to the offseason to where – his name was mentioned in trade rumors. We can't confirm or deny that he was ever asked to waive his no trade. The rumor out there is that he was asked and he said, go chase yourself. I'm not in the mood to move, let alone go to a team that I think is going to be just abysmal next year. So for me, the bounce back player on the decor has got to be Tory Krug. If he's better overall, even defensively, that helps your team. If he's better on the power play, that's massive. Your power play has to be in the top ten this year. Agreed. It has to be. If you're gonna if you're gonna make that playoff push or that even that that uh, that attempt to make the playoffs, your power play has to be in the top ten. All right, which forward for you? Pick one forward to have a bounce back year, or uh, just has to step up. Maybe it's a young guy that you're like, eh, I haven't seen much, but I need this guy to be good. I, I think the guy for me because I, I don't know if any forward really needs a quote-unquote bounce back here maybe an argument could be had for sod but even sod i felt like was kind of the guy that you kind of expect him to be i think the guy i want to see take that next step forward and it's why he doesn't fit the bounce back category is jake neighbors because i, I think the expectations were a little too high for him going into last year to where he was kind of 
by default the guy that was supposed to replace the production of what David Prawn was. And that yeah, was just that was never going to, that was never going to be the case no. for Jake Neighbors last year. So if I can pick one guy that I would say that I want to see take the next step forward, and I, and I do think he will because he's he's got the hockey smarts. Craig Ruby loves him. It's Jake Neighbors. And if he's playing on the second line, maybe this is the third line, I, my guess might be right now, as where things stand, he's probably going to be playing on a line with Shen. He knows Shen really well. So I, I expect there to be kind of that next step taken for Jake Neighbors. Like last year, he finished with six goals, four assist i think maybe next year 10 to 15 goals kind of where i'm hoping he'll be and of course next year you would hope he's here for the full season and doesn't have to go down to the ahl so for me the bounce back player slash step up player it's a new guy kevin hayes I like kevin it. hayes and it's not because he needs a bounce back season as a blue he needs a bounce back season for what he was what he went through last year he was in Philadelphia, had a, a bumpy ride, to say the least, with John Tortorella. Uh, he, his ice time got cut down towards the end of the season. Situational play was cut down. It was a public feud, pretty much. He's got a fresh start here in St. Louis. And whether it's a step-up season, because we need him so much, or a bounce-back season for Kevin Hayes, I think he's my guy this year for the St. Louis Blues. Yeah, I really like that one. And I... To be completely honest, kind of forgot that we had Kevin Hayes because I was looking at the 22-23 roster, what I'm going through and trying to figure out who I'm mm-hmm. going to have for a bounce back. But, yeah, I like that because he is your big offensive acquisition this this uh, offseason. And if he plays well, I mean, the depth up the middle there center-wise, I mean, that's three really good centers, and you've got a pretty good fourth line as well. So I, I like the Kevin Hayes one, and he's a guy that if he scores 20 goals, adds more depth to where you could have centers on both the first, second, and third line that have 20-goal potential. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see that. Hopefully, uh, everybody's ready to go come training camp, which is just around the corner uh, for the St. Louis Blues. All right, coming up next, marshy has got us with a top five sneaky Super Bowl contenders. We'll find out what the heck he means when we come back here on 101 ESPN. section.
last thing here on 101 ESPN. The time is 2.49. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jeweler, official provider of Rolex jewelry. All right, Tanner, Marshy put together a segment here called Top 5 Sneaky Super Bowl Contenders. It's go time, baby. I was ready for my list. All right. Uh, we promise you we're going to drop that in at 430. Top five sneaky Super Bowl contenders will be at 430. Okay, Tanner, your guys on the bump for the Mets tonight. Yeah. Jose Quinta. Mm. A revenge game, some would say. That guy. Yeah, me too. The Cardinals do too. Don't <laughs> worry. All right. Who are we thinking here in the leadoff spot? Old uh, old new bars there. He got... <laughs> He, uh, yeah. he may need a day he got off. Got hit in the newts <laughs> <laughs> last night. Tough one. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Newt Bar. I feel bad for uh, you. I think it's Tommy Edmund here. Oh, he's hurt too, isn't he? Yeah. Or is he? But who would hit a lead off if you're missing both of them? <laughs> but is he hurt? Because we just we heard the roster move. Nolan Gorman moved to yeah. the IL, but Contreras was available off the bench, and Edmund and Newt uh, not. Placed on the IL. What do you think? Are we going to start with a with a eh right away today? No, we can't. We can't. I think it's Tommy Edmund. I think so too. I can't even imagine who else would hit lead off. Ollie might just go. It's an out. We Taylor don't have any. Modern, other. We don't have a, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Show us Tommy Edmund. Oh, all right. That is one tough son of a gun. It is. I like that. All right. Well, I assume he's in center. Yeah. Uh, second, I would assume Goldie. Oh, it's Paul Goldschmidt. Show us that gold. Gold! Rich with gold. Gold! Is this our guy, Nolan Arenado? I think so. All right. Show us. Nolan Arenado! Nolan is a security guard at the lumber yard. Okay, is Contreras back in the lineup? Guys, I messed up. What'd you do? Arenado didn't deserve that. Oh. He didn't deserve it. What yeah, happened? but I the gave sounder's so ways. good, though. It is. We'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. If it was a bad sounder, I'd be more disappointed. But at this point, I'm just forgiving. Okay. Okay? I'm I, sorry. I'm sorry to if, all the listeners. I don't know if Burley's in the line, but he better have a sounder today. Did you see that missile he hit down the left field line? Get that piss missile down the left field line, some would say. Kind of had an exit below of 60 miles an hour, but it's fast in my book. It's good enough. Yeah. It worked. It's a hit. All right. Is Big Willie in here? I think so. Otherwise, I think he probably would have gone on the IL today. So if Big Willie's in, is he DHing? I'm going to say he's probably catching. This I day. think he's DHing because I think they're going to want to set up Wayno for f- success, and he's better with Kisner. Is Ish. He? <laughs> <That's crazy. sighs> All right. Either way, I think this is Will- this is Wilson Contreras. I think so. Too. Show us that Big Willie. This one goes out to all the Big Willies. Wilson. Are you naked? No, Tim, I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Okay, we're hot right now, T-Bone. Five. Who I'm thinking, got? is it Burley? Oh, no, it's a lefty on the map. It's a lefty. Sorry. <laughs> I got a little excited. <laughs> that Burley man. <laughs> he is excited, that's for sure. Uh, All right. Um, O'Neal? Yeah, I think it's Feels Tyler like an O'Neal. O'Neal spot. Show me O'Neal. All right. Okay. Now it's getting down to the nitty gritty. This got to be Jordan Walker. Uh, I mean, you got yeah. Newt is probably not playing, so you need an outfielder. You're not putting Luke and Baker out there. My God, you see him round third. You just give him his best pole. effort. <laughs> <laughs> Show us Jordan Walker. Walk it like it's hot. Walk it like it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seven spot here. Who was seven yesterday? Let's see here. I'm going to go back to my notes. I keep, keep every seven? game for the last four years. Oh, do you? Wow. Yeah. I have all these notepads just full of extra awesome notes. All right, this was Kisner yesterday. So this is where we're the fork in the road right now. I think Contreras is catching. So if I go by that, I don't think Kisner's in the lineup. So who's our DH then? So we need a DH, a second baseman, and a shortstop. Yeah. I think the second baseman, we can already say that's going to be Taylor Motter. It's going to be Matsas. Motter might be at short. So who's at second, then? Fermin, maybe? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Does Palacios play? He's a super utility guy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Got this lineup. Woo. This, this is where we're going to struggle. This is where we're swimming upstream. I, 
I'm going to say because he's so great against lefties, Mater would be my guess. All right. Go ahead, buddy. Show us that great flow in Taylor Motter. You're wrong. <sighs> Dang it. Damn it, T-Bone. Well, All right. that easy. I think it's Andrew Kisner. All right. Show us the captain, Andrew Kisner. Right on, Jamie. Right on. Yeah. I'm the captain. Wow. All right, Kiz Daddy. And now this. Show us the mat sauce. <laughs> it's Jason Bourne. <laughs> All right, so I'm assuming he's at short. And then this has got to be... Uh, it's either Fermin or, uh, or Palacios. Palacios. Palacios may not be here yet. May not. I'm Although gonna... I think last night after the game, they are probably like, we probably should get that guy here. Where was Memphis last night? I think at home. Okay. But I saw in the paper today nobody was pulled from that game. Okay. I'm, All think, right. I'm thinking Fermin. Let's go with Furry Fermin. Jose! Show us, show us that Fermin. I'll be back. All right. Not bad. Not bad. All right, Marsh, you've run it for us. All right, leading off in center field, Tommy Edmond batting second. First baseman, Paul Goldschmidt batting third. Third baseman, Nolan Arnato. Cleanup hitter, the DH, Wilson Contreras, batting fifth in left field, Tyler O'Neill. Batting sixth in right field, Jordan Walker. Batting seventh, the catcher, Andrew Kisner. Batting eighth, the shortstop, Taylor Motsos, Motter. And batting ninth, the second baseman, Jose Fermin. When I think shortstop. Back, 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 back. think shortstops like Trey Turner, you know. Oh, yeah. Xander Bogart. Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. Taylor Cal Potter. Ripken. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor Potter. Potter's yeah. right there. <laughs> All right. Nobody got the Ding Dong Johnson last night. Uh, I'm hit the so, T-Bone, I'm going to give you honors today. Go ahead. All right, that hip, it don't lie. It's healthy now. It's a Wills Contreras home run day. <laughs> it's a good call. That is a good call. All right, Marsh, I'll let you go next. I'm going to take Paul Goldschmidt. All right, Andrew Marsh. Uh, I think it's a Tyler O'Neill type night. I'll take Tyler O'Neill. All right, there are your home runs for tonight. That's your lineup. We have got a treat coming up next. Our guy, Leo Mazzoni, former pitching coach for the Atlanta Braves. We're going to ask him about all things pitching next here in the Fast Lane on 101 ESPN.
Fast Lane here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers here, Tanner Hendrickson joining me, and Andrew Marsh working the board. We go out to the celebrity line to be joined by one of our favorites here in the Fast Lane. Uh, heck, he might as well just be the fourth member of the Fast Lane here today. Former Braves pitching coach Leo Mazzoni. Leo, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. We're getting ready to celebrate Alumni Weekend in Atlanta starting tomorrow and uh, Saturday. So we'll get to see a lot of the guys and, uh, you know, have a, have a cocktail or two and tell some stories. Yeah, I know what those are like. We've got uh, the Blues alumni things. We have a camp every year. We have some people that come in and we get together. And we have a few pops, usually a few too many, Leo. But it's always a good time. <laughs> yeah, if you can remember it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Leo, I think the biggest question that's going on right now, or one of in Cardinal Nation, is the Adam Wainwright story. And look, let's mm-hmm. just be honest. Wainwright's had a decorated career, uh, one of the most celebrated Cardinals pitchers, maybe in the history of the franchise, just a great human being. But, man, things are not going well for Waino here. If you're the, the pitching coach, the manager, you're part of the organization, you know, what are some of the discussions like with a guy like Adam Wainwright right now? Well, I think some of the discussions are, well, should we pitch him? Should we not pitch him? This and that. But you know what? Those discussions mean nothing now because the Cardinals aren't going anywhere. So anyway, why not give him the opportunity to get 200 wins? Well, that's what I would do because now if you're in a pennant race, that might be a little bit of a different story. And I know you got to, Make sure the fans know that you're trying to win baseball games. Well, Adam Wainwright knows how to win baseball games. It's a matter of, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, contr- uh, execution on his part. But I would give him the ball every fifth day and uh, try to get him to that level of 200 wins and uh, and call it a career. Only because they have nothing to get, they have nothing to lose. So, Leo, let me ask you this: What you think of this strategy, or maybe this this suggestion? That's probably a better word. And I suggested this: is if Wayno's really looking for the two hundred wins, is it an easier path for him to get there coming out of the bullpen? And I only I say that with all due respect to Adam Wainwright, he just mm-hmm. hasn't had a really easy time getting through five innings with a lead so far this year. I, I think probably it'd be more difficult coming out of the bullpen because the score is going to dictate how you use him, how you you know, and you got to you got to understand that there's other pitchers involved in this as far as wins and losses and contract years and all that sort of thing. So I would just go ahead and have him plan, knowing when he's going to pitch, and put everything into what he wants to do to get those 200 wins. And I think he'll do it. I think he'll figure out a way to get it done. And um, uh, so look, you know, you got it you have to show a lot of respect for people like Adam Wainwright that have had tremendous careers. I know he's at the end of his career. I had to go through that with some great hall of fame pitchers and I refused to give up on him. And I would refuse to give up on Adam trying to get him those 200 wins. You're in a pennant race. Now, you know, we got, then you're going to have some discussions that really mean something, you know, but it doesn't mean anything. The Cardinals have not had a good year. And uh, so there's a few things left for the guys to accomplish and, you know, one of those is Adam getting 200 wins and, uh, and putting out the top on a great St. Louis Cardinal career. Leo, how far does that go in the clubhouse with some of the players, some of the veteran players? You know, you're watching a guy like Adam Wayne, right? It, 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 it's no secret. He's struggling. He's having a tough go. It's the end yeah, of I know. the road for him. But how far does that go in the clubhouse when a manager or staff just says, you know what, man, you have done so much good for us. We're going to stand by you. We're going to let you get out there and battle for those 200 wins. Well, I think that's what you should say, just how you worded it right there. And I guarantee you the players want that. The players would want him to get that, achieve that goal. And guess what? That motivates the players when he's pitching to, to, to score some runs and, and uh, give him a little breathing room. You know what I mean? So it would go over well in the clubhouse. I, I don't think there's – if anybody didn't like that in the clubhouse, then they shouldn't be in the clubhouse to begin with. Leo, the Cardinals have a young left-handed starter, Matthew Libertor, 23 years old, and he's been up yeah. for really two years now, and he's made 18 starts at the big league level. And I, I've got a question for you because the the problem that Libertor has had since he's been up here at the big leagues is he's able to start off with his velo around 94, 93, but it starts to dip off through his outings to about, la- like last night, for example, in about the fifth inning, he's sitting around 90, 91. When you see that from a pitcher having trouble maintaining his velocity throughout a start how do you work on that with him and is that something that can be fixed in season yes it can and you, what it is you don't you don't care what the velocity is 
Number one, if velocity drops a couple miles an hour, what's that mean? You can't pitch or get anybody out? That's a bunch of crap. What it is is that whatever you're working with on in that particular inning and whatever you're throwing, we're talking about location. We're talking about you get a hitter out with uh, stuff, movement, change of speeds, location, and motion. Those are all a lot of things that you get a guy out with. And the thing is, just because somebody drops off two miles an hour or whatever it is, everybody goes into panic mode. Let me tell you something. Analytics and all the stuff that goes with it has set pitching back about 30, 40 years. And nobody knows how to handle pitching staffs anymore, you know, including the Cardinals and including a whole lot of major league teams. When you're making 30 pitching changes a year and doing all that sort of thing, that's unheard of as far as I'm concerned. You give that kid – he pitched against the Braves, pitched good, you know, and um, – so I know what he's capable of, but what, what are you going to do? You're going to go into panic mode if he loses two miles an hour off his fastball? Who cares? If he's locating, it don't matter. And our guys used to say this, we can tell you what's coming, but if we put it where we want to, it ain't going to matter. You simplify the game for him. That's all you do. You simplify it. Now, what's he going to do when you tell him he's down two miles an hour? You know what he's going to do? He's going to try to get that two miles an hour back. So at some, you know, during the game or at next start or whatever. Well, guess what you do when you try to get velocity back? You injure your arm. You're overexerting and you're straining to get those two miles an hour back when it doesn't mean nothing. If you're locating your pitches, it doesn't mean nothing. A located fastball and a located secondary pitch, which is a change of speeds, whether it's your breaking ball or your changeup, will take care of everything. All you do is simplify it. You know, you don't need to go to geometry class or algebra class. These other stuff to hear some of this stuff. I'm going to tell you what, guys, I have a tough time. I got to turn the volume down unless I'm listening to Glavin Smoltz do a ball game or something like that. But, you know, I got I can't listen to it. It's just hard for me to handle. But that's I would love to have that kid. And here's what you do. Don't, don't, don't labor. I mean, don't just keep harping on velocities down two miles an hour. My God, what's that mean? You can't pitch no more? <laughs> well, of course you can. And plus, the fact is, you might have better control at 91 than you do at 95. And that's how you stay healthy when you understand the amount of effort you're putting into it. But all you're doing is making it worse on that young man. If it's if, if, what's going on, two miles an hour down, it doesn't matter. You've got to just locate your pitches and pitch, not throw. Leo, one of the things the Cardinals have had trouble with this year uh, is hanging on to leads. And I'm not talking offensively, just the bullpen has come in and they've had they've had a tough year. 25 blown saves. Mm-hmm. When, when you're looking at that and, and you're looking at the Cardinals season and you're looking at the fact that a lot of their starters have not gone deep into games, are you looking at a bullpen that's maybe just been taxed out a little too much or just not executing properly? You just enter, answered your own question. Starters not going very few innings. The starting rotation takes care of the bullpen. The bullpens are being abused all across baseball. Everywhere bullpens are abused. The Cardinals are no different than a lot of other teams. Everybody's breaking down. You know and what they do is a guy pitches a couple innings and then after he's done, you send them back down and bring up somebody else and you make all these changes. And I believe that some guys are sent down and they're not really hurt. To be honest with you, and I think that. The starting rotation, you just answered your own question by saying the starting rotation doesn't go deep enough into games. There's nothing wrong with a starting rotation taking care of your bullpen. What's baseball doing? They're going from the back end to the front, and they're ruining pitching in baseball. Uh, you, you, I watch guys. I watch a lot of baseball. The control that some of these guys have is absolutely horrible. And where catchers set up, and I look in at the strike zone, and the catcher sets up, and you're going up and in on strike one or you're doing all this crazy stuff, you know, no wonder pitch counts are up because everybody's trying to hit a pitch in quads. In other words, up and away, down and away, up and in, down and in. And everybody's throwing pitches to get a swing and a miss. Nobody's pitching to contact. Well, you want contact on the end or on the handle. Now, if you're trying to swing and miss, get a guy to swing and miss on every pitch, it's like, oh, well, this guy's down in the minor leagues. I heard some announcers say, yeah, he's got a lot of swing and miss pitches. Well, what good's that do you? I mean, come on. What? If, how about a one pitch out on a ground ball or hit hit the handle or hit the end and change speeds a little bit? I mean, that's lo- that's how you get longevity. You do not get longevity by forcing velocity issues on an individual. Leo, if we're looking at the bullpen again and and go basically going off of what you just said that you know the bullpen's being taxed too much and the the starters mm-hmm. not going deep enough. 
At what point do you start to manage your bullpen differently or train your bullpen guys differently? Should we be stretching out the bullpen guys a little bit more if the starters, like if the trend is that they're not going to go deep into games, and you know how it is. Right now, the trend is exactly that. Four innings, five innings, five and dive, we're done. Yeah, it's a joke. Do you? I couldn't agree more. But do you start to train your bullpen guys differently so that they, they don't get burnt out? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think that you got to make sure that um, – see, what I used to do was – what we had to do was work, we worried about the bullpen getting not getting enough work. You know, so there'd be – we wanted three or four guys to come and complain to me that they weren't getting enough work. That means that our starters were getting us to one setup guy and a closer. Okay? I mean, what's so hard about that? But now you're getting four and a third, take him out. Five plus, take him out. Oh, I got a shutout going, take him out. I got a no hitter going, take him out. And now, therefore, your bullpen up and down and up and down and in and out, not even counting the times that they warm up and don't get in. So the bullpens are abused, especially your setup guy. They they get abused. But how many now they have like how many setup guys do you need for crying out loud? And here's the other thing. If you were worried about lefty, lefty, righty, righty matchups, I used to do everything I could to teach our setup guys learn the the importance of a straight change. Why? Because if you had a straight change, that negated lefty, lefty, righty, righty matchups. If you had a left-hander out there in the bullpen, he had a, he developed a good change. Go ahead and pinch hit a righty. We don't care, and vice versa. Go ahead and pinch hit a lefty. We don't care. My right-hander's got a good change, or you know something like that. And those are things that you talk about with the bullpen. The other thing is, if you've warmed somebody up more than twice in the game, you don't bring him in after that. But I don't you know how they warm up guys now, and they and they they just they can't. Guys, the baseball teams cannot wait to get a starting pitcher out of the game for some damn reason, and I don't understand it. I don't like it, and uh, but that's just me. What do I know? No, you know a lot, Leo. Trust me. Well, uh, Leo, <laughs> we've been we've been talking about the bullpen here, and I asked you about the young lefty for the Cardinals. They've got multiple young pitchers that have kind of been iffy as starters and they've been and one guy specifically is Zach Thompson been a starter then they sent him to, or he came up to start the year as a bullpen arm then they sent him down to stretch out as a starter and now he's back in the bullpen and then he's now back in the rotation for the St. Louis Cardinals what goes right. into the thought process when you're looking at a young arm that you have in your system and trying to determine whether or not he's a starter versus if he needs to become a reliever for you well they can't figure it out I mean somebody needs to figure something like that out in other words in other words when he's in the minor leagues, he needs to start. All good relievers in the big leagues, all, all relievers that are developed in your farm system, okay? You don't develop the reliever in A-ball. What you do is all your best arms. Say you had five arms in AAA, or, you know, three good arms in AAA, three good arms in AA, three good arms in single A. They all start, and they all learn how to pitch. Then when they get through a, 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 a halfway through their AAA season, you have to determine whether he has the ability to rebound and be a reliever as opposed to a starter. You just can't keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's a completely different mindset between starting and relieving, okay? And you cannot you, – you get teeter-totter, teeter-totter. You know why they're doing that? Because they really don't know what he's going to do. And they should. Somebody should know. And, and, and let's, for example, Kent Marker was a lefty. You know, he pitched for a long time. Pitched for the Cardinals, you know. And – uh he pitched 17 years, but how Merker became a reliever was he came up as a fifth starter, but then we had enough starting pitching, and we felt that Merck could rebound, and for one inning he had that nice uh, late-action fastball that took off, and for one inning he was great. He pitched 17 years doing it, you know. And uh, well, Mike Stanton started in the minor leagues. Uh, Steve Bedrosian, Bedrock was a starter his entire career until he became a reliever, and then he won a Cy Young as a closer for the Phillies. You develop your pitchers. You've got to give your pitchers innings pitched to learn how to pitch. And Major League Baseball was taking away innings pitched. Leo, you're one of the best, man. We absolutely love having you on here. You always bring the fire and the passion and just love your expertise in the pitching field. So, my man, thank you so much for joining us here again today. You know, you know, thanks, thanks a lot, and I hope the Cardinals get back on track. They're, they're a great fan base. And by the way, my very first year as a manager, I had a catcher named Mark Senovich, and he lives in the, in the Heights. And 
I wanted to holler at him because I told him I was going to be on the show today. And my whole career started in Corpus Christi, Texas, and he was the starting catcher, and he helped us win a couple of championships. So I tip my hat to him. You never forget who helped you before. No, that's uh, those are great words to live by. So, well, hopefully he's listening. Hopefully he caught that, Leo. And uh, take care of yourself, my man. Until next time, we'll be bugging you soon. Don't worry. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's get ready for some postseason baseball. It's going to be good. I love it, man. Way, right. guys, the, Braves, the Braves are good. Oh, but they're not good. They're fantastic, Leo. <laughs> it's not even fair. They're a cheat code out there. You can't get anybody <laughs> out for crying out loud. <laughs> my God. They're doing good. It'll be fun to watch them go. That's right. All right, Leo. Take care, my friend. You got it. All right. That was Leo Mazzoni, former Braves pitching coach, joining us again here in the fast lane. I just love Leo. I love Leo. I would love to sit down with a 12-pack or more and just talk baseball with Leo. Just talk life. I don't even care. Yeah, he's got great passion for the game of baseball, and I'd love to hear the stories of his upcoming through the major leagues and the teaching of it. I mean, he was the pitching coach for one of the greatest rotations that we've ever seen for years in Atlanta, and you hear the passion with him still. And I, I think some of the things he says is right. Libertor does he have to have success at 95, 90, or 94, 95 miles an hour? Not necessarily, but then he's going to have to start locating his fastball better if that's going to be the case. All right, it's 316 here in the fast lane. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers. Uh, text line is 314-399-9646. If you've got any questions regarding the St. Louis Blues at all, any of the offseason upcoming player questions, we're going to get into Blues cues next here on 101 ESPN.
It's time for the Fast Lane's Blues Cues. Welcome back inside the Fast Lane here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers driving the bus today. Tanner Hendrickson in for Anthony Stalter and Andrew Marsh on the dials. We asked you for your questions. 314 399 9646. It's time for Blues Cues. Marshy, what do we got? All right, gentlemen, from the 573, what are you guys expecting out of the Blues goalie tandem? Ooh, I'm excited. I am. I think it's a, it's going to be a really good balance of goaltending here this year for the Blues. You know, last year, Thomas Grice did a really good job when called upon. Some of the games that he was in there, I mean, he was absolutely peppered. I mean, he, he had some really good performances, but it was a tough spot for him to be in. I think Jordan Bennington's going to have a really solid year, and I think Joel Hofer's going to have a really solid rookie campaign. Will it be all roses all the time? No, of course not. But I, I am excited for this tandem. I do think that it will allow Jordan Bennington to not be overworked, at the same time giving Joel Hofer enough work to keep developing. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm excited to see what Hofer looks like, as I liked what we saw in the small spurt in which he was up with the team. And I'm excited to see what Bennington looks like, because I thought last year, though, his numbers showed that he had a bad season. It wasn't on him. It was on all the backdoor tappings that we saw. So if the defense just takes a slight step forward, I'm excited to see what Bennington looks like in front of them. What do you think the split's going to be? Like, 50 starts, 55 starts for Bennington. The rest go to Hofer, somewhere in that range. Yeah, I think to be anywhere between 27 and 32 starts for Hofer, okay. depending on you know how he does and whatnot. I, I like Bennington in and around the 50 start mark. And then if your team does make the playoffs, he's not completely burnt out. I, I'd agree with that. I, I like that too because I, I think you got to pull off some of the workload from him as it was last year too. So I, I would agree. I think 50, 55 is kind of where I would sit with him. From the 636, over under 46 points this year for Kevin Hayes. Oh, I'm going over on that. I think that, look, I think he had 54 points last year for the Flyers, and we already talked about the fact that uh, his role kind of diminished throughout the season to where, you know, John Tortorella really wasn't using him in, in favorable situations. Um, but I think I think Kevin Hayes is going to get a great opportunity to play on the power play, whether it's the first power play or the second power play. I have no idea. Uh, that'll depend on what Craig Ruby decides to do. I know Kevin Hayes is a big body. He could probably find his way in front of the net, although Braden Shen likes to be there, too. Either way, I think definitely over on that one for big boy Kevin Hayes. What was number 46 and a half? Is that what you said? Yeah. Mm hmm. I'll take over, too. I think he'll be kind of like where he was last year. He finished with 54 points. I, I think he'll be somewhere in that range, right around the 20-goal mark, right around kind of the 35, 40 assists range. So I, I think it'll be somewhere basically what he was last year. So I'm going to say over. From the 618, Blue's question, was there strong finish at the end of the last season, smoke and mirrors, or the real deal? What do you think, t -Bone? Did you turn to me because I was negative yesterday? No, I just was letting oh. you go first. I thought maybe you wanted me no, to. I was being polite. Negative. I didn't want to go first and just oh. steal, uh, you know, throw well, out my opinion. I appreciate that. I'm going to well, say. Anyways, so I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it wasn't completely smoke and mirrors. I, I do think that you're going to see some things improve with this team. I think they're deeper now in terms of from where they were at that back portion of the year where you add Kevin Hayes, who we just talked about, into the lineup. And I think the power play is going to be better. You got Verona that'll be on that top unit. Kyru there. You got Krug. Hopefully has the bounce back here that we talked about earlier. And now you hopefully have a backup goaltender, too, that's going to take a little bit more of that bulk of the load from Jordan Bennington in uh, Hofer. So... I'm still skeptical of where I would put them in terms of where at the Western Conference ranking wise, but I don't think it was completely smoke and mirrors the second half last year. Yeah, I don't think it was smoke and mirrors at all for that matter. To be honest, I think that what happened is the Blues got back to being much more of a blue collar team, simplifying their game and really competing out there. They, they, they lacked the compete in their game for at least half the season last year, maybe even longer. And I think that was a real frustrating part of things for guys like Craig Berube on the coaching staff, players like Braden Shen, where you're sitting there and you're like, how are we not competing? I think that once there was some certainty surrounding what their lineup was going to be uh, post-trade deadline, where it's not that you wanted to lose an Ivan Barbashev, that's for sure, because he's one of your guys that does compete. 
But you did have some clarity at that point uh, of what you were going to move ahead with, and I think that the team competed at a good level. So for me, I don't think it was smoke and mirrors. I think it was a team that realized, hey, we need to finish strong. We have a good group of players here, but we're not going to wow anybody. We have to outwork them. We have to outplay them. And I think that that will carry over into this season. From the 636, what is the Blues' best top line grouping and best defensive pairing? Well, the top line, depending on what Chief decides to do, is Booch Davich, Thomas, and Cairo. Agreed. That's I think that's that's what you got. You got Booch, Thomas, and Cairo. Um, for me, that's easily the number one line. I don't see anybody else getting any time up there unless things don't go well for these guys. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that's definitely going to be the top line unless, and we've seen Craig Bruby's willing to change things up for like five games, handful of games, because they just need to, whether it be generate offense, just change things up across the board. And then the top defensive pairing, I mean, it's going to be Preko and Letty like it was last year. Yeah. And I, I mean, don't see that changing either. No, it has to be. It has to be. Those guys have to elevate their game. Uh, they have to be the top D pairing for the St. Louis Blues. Last one here before we head to our next segment, the most important question of our Blues Cues segment. Will Jamie be doing in-game interviews with Chief? Uh, probably. I don't know. We'll see. It depends on, you know, Chief. well, one, Chief is always awesome. He doesn't care. He comes on here every week, whether they're winning or losing. Um, and I did a bunch of the games last year where we did the in-game interview. It's quite honestly, it's more of a pain in the butt to get over there. You've, <laughs> you've, you've got like 10 seconds. Do you have to hop? Yeah. Because like, I know you're like it's, in between the benches. Do you have to hop to go on the yeah. ice and then on? No, not on the, on the ice, bench. but you hop over the one board that's there. Then you got to hop over the other one. Then you got to get on the bench, avoid the trainers, avoid mm. the equipment guy, ask the assistant coach to move, tell, scooch by the players on the bench. I look you in the eye and go, no, I'm not moving. Who did that? Ah, uh, no. Steve, I do that. No, Otter's great. Oh, he's fantastic. But then you end up with Chief, and mm -hmm. Chief is great, but he like, he wants you to get after because he's got to coach his hockey club. Right. So you do all that for like a 23 second blurb mm -hmm. from the head coach, which is always nice to get a little perspective. It's a lot of work for it, though. I don't know. We'll see. We'll we'll discuss it. What, like I have a say in anything. <laughs> what does that look like, though? Like, when do you? hop in there 10 minute mark uh the second period okay so it is so always... there's always a whistle and a, a commercial break at that point so he knows that you're he knows going to do that yeah 100 percent. yeah okay. we don't blindside him also i'm standing beside him with chief, the chief, chief. can you imagine <laughs> now that's a good way to get punched <laughs> yeah, I Jamie. Say, I can uh, see... <laughs> chief going no he's looking at me what the hell are you doing here which he's done that before too he's, what the hell are you doing well, <laughs> he knows chief, you're coming <laughs> i'm just doing my job buddy all right, that was Blues Cues here on 101 ESPN. Coming up next, we've got NFL Boom or Bust.
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Andrew Marsh. It's time for a Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The cards fall to the Athletics last night by a final score of eight to nothing. Matthew Libertor went four and a third, gave up 10 hits, five earned runs, and he walked three. Adam Wainwright will be on the mound tonight going up against Jose Quintana and the New York Mets. First pitch is at 615 on Fox. Matt Holiday joined the show earlier today as well as Leo Mazzoni. If you missed any of those interviews, make sure you go to 101ESPN.com or check out the 101 mobile app. You can find all of our interviews, including our full show. It's all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. I'm Andrew Marsh, and the Sports Center update is brought to you by Saliga. Heating and cooling. An independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Same here on 101 ESPN. Tanner Hendrickson sitting in for Anthony Stalter. Jamie Rivers here. Andrew Marsh on the dials. It's time for NFL Boom or Bust. All right, gentlemen, let's look at some of these players. We'll also go over some coaches and some teams as well. But let's start off with Saquon Barkley, a part of the New York Giants. We know that he had some contract uh, disputes going on earlier in the summer. Mm -hmm. Finally got that all cleared up. But last year, Saquon had a pretty decent season. What are you thinking this year? Oh, I think he's going to have another good year. I think he has to have a good year. That's the thing with the Giants is you can't rely on Daniel Jones to be dropping dimes out there. What? I know. I know. I'm sorry, Tanner. They call him Danny Dimes, though. I know. They, I think it's mockingly, to be honest. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, that does make sense. A, a little bit. But Saquon's going to get the ball a lot. He's going to have to have another good year for the Giants to be competitive in their division. So I, I think Saquon has a big year. Yeah, I'm going to say boom as well. If he stays healthy, I can't imagine having him a down year. And like you said, he's going to be the focus of the offense. And, and I don't like teams that are operating like or operate like the Giants, like the Titans, where it is, hey, our running back has a good year. We have a good year because that is really tough to sustain because those guys get hurt a lot. But I think if he stays healthy, he'll have another really good year. So I'm going to say boom. All right, Odell Beckham Jr., who has been injured. He's now with the Ravens. What do you think? Boom or bust for OBJ? Oof. You would expect a boom, right? Because he's with Lamar. He signed a nice contract and whatnot. I'm going bust. I'm going bust. He missed a whole year last year. He missed a whole year with a serious injury, and he had a serious injury before that. Mm-hmm. I don't see him having a good year. Now, is he able to perform? Yeah, he's a good receiver, but I I feel like he's going to be hindered again by some kind of an injury or the fact that he just doesn't have that ability anymore to get open as easily as he did before. So unfortunately for for OBJ, I'm calling bust. I'm actually going boom with OBJ. I I love the Ravens offense now that they've actually got a good offensive coordinator in and Todd Monken. Uh, I I like the offense with Lamar. I think they're going to open up the passing game more for Lamar. And I I just see this being a year where I I view it a little bit differently. I think he's going to be more fresh since he didn't have to play last year coming off this knee injury. I I think he has a really good year because he was good with the Rams when they had him before he tore the ACL uh, in the Super Bowl, if I remember correctly. I think he has a big year. I'm going to say boom. Let's look at Anthony's favorite team, the Atlanta Falcons. They drafted a running back in the first round, which we all know he loves. Bijan Robinson, what do we think about him in his rookie year? Boom or bust? Man, this so this goes right back to what Tanner said uh, initially about Saquon Barkley and, and Derrick Henry is you hate to pin it all on one guy. I really hate pinning it all on a rookie. Yeah. Especially with a team that doesn't have a great offensive line. Uh, it's a kind of a mid team all around. I think this poor, uh, he's a talented individual, but I think he's going to take a beating. So I, I don't know. It, it, it might be boom for the simple fact that he has a good offensive year for the Falcons, but it might be bust because overall he just gets absolutely manhandled out there. Yeah. I, I'm t- I, I don't know. I think I'm going to go bust. 
It's I'm 50-50 like, because I could see I, where... I know. I, I sat right on the fence. Look, there's yeah. a lot of hype around him, too. So if you want to maybe measure him up to the amount of hype that he has... Will you the could success yeah. match, you know, the prediction? For sure. Okay. I, I think where he could become a boom in this scenario is because Desmond Ritter's their quarterback, they have to dump the ball off to the running back a ton, and then he, he becomes more of a threat in the passing game, which he's already going to be, mm-hmm. but he comes even more than what we're expecting, and he has the running game as well, but a lot of pressure on him. So I, I'm going to say bust. I, I just can't see him on, in that Falcons team having much success, and I think he may struggle in year one. Let's look at another guy who is in a new system on a new team. Formerly with the Vegas Raiders, now with the New Orleans Saints, Derek Carr, boomer bust. Wow. Uh, oof. So with Derek Carr, he's like one of the most under the radar quarterbacks of this era, really, because he ends up finishing the season with good yards, and but nobody ever really talks about it. I think he's going to a, a pretty good team in New Orleans. I'm going to say he's a boom this year for the Saints. I'm going bust. Oh, t- I'm Tanner. Not, I'm, not high, I'm not high on the Saints Why like you, you are. Why negative? I'm not high on the Saints, nor am I high at all right now. Well, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to say bust. I, I just, I'm not a fan of the Saints. I, I feel like they're, they're that guy that has the motorcycle. They should probably get rid of it. You know, mm. you look at him, dude, you're past your prime. It's time to move on from the motorcycle. Now you're an ageist. I, Old people yeah. can't ride motorcycles? Yeah. Wow. It's Older time to people move on. You're going to tell Sam Elliott he can't ride a Harley Davidson? It's time to move yeah, on. Yeah, I Older people love motorcycles. It's time to move on. We got to get rid you know, get rid of the sports car. We got to start moving on from all this yeah, stuff. You're getting rid of sports cars Saints, now, too? Saints, it's time. Oh, so for, what should they drive? A minivan? Yeah. A key, like a Kia? Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Wow. Maybe a Nissan Sentra? Tanner, I've, I, I have Saints, been disappointed in you before, but I don't know about quite this much. The Saints are rejecting the idea that they should rebuild, and they should. I don't think they're a good football so team. So you had to insult old people to get to that? Yeah. Wow. As a young lad myself, you it's know. disappointing. We got a text from the 636. So then how do you feel about Calvin Ridley, Jamie, with not playing for a year? So we'll throw him in the mix, too. Boomer bust Calvin Ridley with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah, I think he's going to be just fine, though, Calvin Ridley. He, you know, he, he was out for other reasons, we'll say. And he's got Trevor Lawrence. And that team was... That team ended the season really strong last year. Heck, they had a good playoff push, good playoff. I, I think he has a... I think it's boom for him, for sure. I think so, too. I, I think he's going to have a really big year. And I, I said part of the reason I'm banking on Odell Beckham was because he's had a year off. He's been recuperating from knee injury. Well, it really doesn't have a knee injury. So I, I think he's going to have a really big year. I, I can't remember. He li- I think it's he likes to run the out routes. Trevor Lawrence loves to hit those. So I, I can see where Ridley has a huge year. So I'm going to go boom. All right, let's move on to some uh, a couple coaches real quick. Uh, Shane Steichen, new Colts head coach. Boomer bust for... <laughs> For the new coach. I'm just going to go with the odds. I'm going to say bust. <laughs> I'm going to do <laughs> right, What about Frank Reich in, in uh, Carolina? Oh, bust. wow. Yeah. It, it has not looked great so far in no. Carolina. And our guy Anthony's talking about Frank Reich getting the quarterback murdered out so there. So I was watching Hard Knocks and... The Jets defense was absolutely getting after it yeah. when they played them this past week. But that was like the Carolina starting yes. line, too. Yes. Woof. Yeah, bust. Huge bust. Uh-huh. Last one here. Let's do a Best team. Kind. The Chicago Bears, lots of hype between, <laughs> or uh, lots of hype around Justin Fields, and they got some new offensive weapons. What are we thinking about the Bears? Boom or bust? T Bone? Ba boom. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, wow. the uh, Illinois guy here. Oh, I hate the Bears. Oh, no, he's but, a huge Rams fan. Yeah. LA. Oh, that's, that's true. <laughs> uh, but the Bears, I, I think they're going to take the next step this year. I think Fields will, too. So I'm going to say boom. Yeah, I'm going to go with boom at this point. I think th- th- Vegas can't be wrong. Vegas is all over Justin Fields as uh, MVP candidate and all those other things. So I'm going to go boom with that one. All right, it's a fast lane here on 101 ESPN. Coming up next, we've got Am I Crazy?
Are you crazy? You're crazy. Am I crazy? We're talking paranoid delusional psychosis. Do you have any crazy thoughts or opinions? Buckle up, it's a crazy season. Send them our way for the fast lanes. Am I crazy? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Come on, let's get crazy. <laughs> To Fast Lane here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers with you here. Tanner Hendrickson, Andrew Marsh, Anthony Stalter be back on Tuesday. Get a little family time here before the school year starts. Okay, our St. Louis Blues, we talk about them quite a bit in your last couple of days. Well, we got a Blues ticket giveaway. The Fast Lane has your chance to win a pair of tickets to see your St. Louis Blues take on the Arizona Coyotes on October 19th at the Enterprise Center. Hockey season will be here before you know it. And 101 ESPN wants to celebrate with your chance to win free tickets. Free is always good. Text in to 314-399-9646 to win that pair of tickets for the Blues versus the Coyote. By the way, single game tickets for the Blues 23-24 season go on sale this Friday at 10 a.m. And the season is stacked with great giveaway nights, including the Bennington Champs Parade bobblehead. We remember that one. And the new and returning theme nights. Check out the full promotion schedule and secure your seats for the upcoming season at stlouisblues.com today. All right, here's your trivia question. The St. Louis Blues played the Phoenix Coyotes I believe a record number of times in a row in a regular season in the 2020-2021 season. How many games in a row did they play the Phoenix Coyotes? Tanner, well, put your hand down. Put your hand down. Oh. Text in to 314-399-9646. Texter 101, you'll get a chance to win the tickets. Again, how many times did the Blues play the Coyotes in a row in 2021? All right, Marshy, let's go. All right, guys, am I crazy, or will the Blues have a 100-point player this upcoming year? Ooh, T-Bone, you've been really negative. You go first. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. So if the guys that were going to do it, it would be probably Thomas or Cairo. Well, according to you, Verona. Yeah, why not? He's got a 50 and 50, you Hell, said. Kapanen could get there. <laughs> Great year. A couple pucks go his way. Yeah, yeah, a little puck luck. Could Booch get there? Booch had 67 and 63. Um, I'm going to say, man, you crazy. I don't think I don't think a Blues player will get to 100. I, I think at best you could see someone get like 80 to 90, and that would be probably Kairou Thomas. Maybe Booch gets up into that spot, but 100 is a lot, and I don't know if they've got a guy that will do that. Yeah, I don't think they're ready to make that jump yet. Uh, I've talked about it quite a bit so far. I think that Thomas and Kairou, what they've been really good at is they've gotten to that point-per-game plateau. Now this year they got to get to that 90 to 95 points, somewhere in there, and then the year after that you got to start looking at 100. you got to start tickling 100, the two years from now. So I don't think they get a guy in the 100-point range because I think their offense is also going to be diversified. I think there's going to be a lot of people that are contributing to the offense, not just like one or two guys. Am I crazy, or will Jordan Walker be a plus defender in the outfield next season? Oh, I think you're crazy. I think you're crazy. I, I think he's going to be much improved. He, he, listen, I said this before. He's a pure athlete. I mean, he has a physical specimen out there. To go from, what is it, third base is where he yeah. played? Third base. I always get it mixed up. I, I want to put him at first base for some reason. Probably because right, you're thinking his future position. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but he would go from third base to the outfield. Everything changes. We talked to Matt Holiday about that earlier, and he's like going from you know ground balls to pop flies is a, is a different animal altogether. So I, I think he's improved. I don't think he's a plus defender that quickly. Yeah. Man, you crazy. I, I, I think <laughs> I, I don't think he'll get there next year. I, I think we're two years away before we're talking about him being a plus defender. I, I'm with Jamie, though. I think you see the right steps, not just here at the end of the year. I think until last night where he had the blunder out there in right field, he's been looking better. I think it'll be the same case next year. He'll look better. I think he'll be an average defender next year. I think by year three of him being in the big leagues is when we're talking about him being a plus defender. From the 314, am I crazy to think that the Chiefs won't make the playoffs? Oh, you're absolutely insane. There's no way Patrick Mahomes doesn't make the playoffs. If Patrick Mahomes was just out there by himself, he has a chance to make the playoffs. 
I can just picture him throwing the ball to himself. Yeah, you know well, Marcus what? Marcus Mariota did. Yeah, he did it. Yeah. Look where he is now. Anyways. Um, <laughs> where is he, by the way? I'm not sure. He is with the <laughs> Eagles. Is he? Mm-hmm. Fly, Eagles, fly. Yeah, you're insane. Yeah. Uh, man, you crazy. I don't even need to answer. <laughs> From the 636, am I crazy? I feel like the syst- uh, I feel like a system change can make the Blues defense back to top 10 in the league. Woof. Top 10? I, I don't think you're crazy. And actually, to, to take it one step farther, to look at the way they finished last season from a defensive standpoint, it was much better. Was it great? No, but it was much better. I think that this year, Craig Berube and the staff, knowing full well what they have to accomplish and how things have to change, I think they're going to be more aggressive on the forecheck. They're going to have a lot tighter neutral zone and, and therefore, the defensive zone is going to be a lot more attended to. I think the net front is going to be policed heavily. At least it has to be. If it isn't, they'll have a lot of the same problems. But uh, top 10, I, I think they can get close to that, in and around that. Man, you crazy. Oh, Tanner, here we go. Uh, but I do tend to agree with you. I, I don't think it can be top 10. Top 10 feels like a massive jump from what we saw last year. But, but is it? I mean, it was pretty bad Go back year. to two years ago. Man. Kind of bad then, too. Eh, not that bad. Not yeah, as bad not as last that bad. year. They were pretty good, though, at the end of, what, the 2021-2022 year when, when Nick Letty came in. I know we were just sort of talking about defense needing to be shirt up a little bit. I think Nick Letty is one of those players that if he can get back to the guy Absolutely. that he was, this team can be really good, especially paired with Colton Pareko, who had a better ending to his year last season. I think they could maybe flirt with top 10. I got one for you, Jamie. Am I crazy? Yes. But, well, let me finish. Oh, sorry. Am it's I all crazy? about you finishing, isn't it? Yes, please. Mm. You never get to let Tanner finish. No, yeah. I know. It doesn't well, take me. No, it's it all doesn't about finishing me. for him, apparently. It doesn't take me long, okay? That's a good point. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's get it over with. <laughs> <laughs> Am I crazy? But Paul Blackburn looks like a guy that could be in the Cardinals oh, rotation next year. Man, you crazy. Oh, come on. Get that gunk out of here. You don't Why? like a you don't like a four oh nine ERA. I mean, I'll take it right now. <laughs> I, if if Blackburn is a guy that the Cardinals covet, I mean, woof, that is not not what I was expecting. I I would have interest, but it would be like near the bottom of my list. It would be like okay, we we he, I'm not getting him as a one or two, by the way, just so we're clear. But if I look at it, you get your one and two, sign them, and then you're looking on the trade market, and you can get him for, I don't know, you dump off a Juan Yapez, maybe someone else, mm. and you can bring him in. I'd be interested. He's, How old he's is interesting. He? How old is he? What is he making? Was it? What is He'll, his contract? So What's his situation as a kid? Two say? more years of club control, I know, because I looked this up last night. And you night. think you're just dumping Yepes for him? I mean, it's Oakland. Like, they might take anything. Yeah, but they're going to be looking for Vegas. They need talent. You know what they don't have? Talent. A lot of untalented players. Except for Paul Blackburn. He'll make about probably 3 to $4 million next year. He'll be 30 years old, and he's got about two years of club control left. 30. Oof. Age is but a number. Oh, yeah, you were the, the motorcycle guy. Well, he mm. could have a motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, look, if he is the, the guy that you... You put in there as your fifth guy in the rotation. I could deal with that. Guys, tonight Adam Wainwright goes up against against former Cardinal Jose Quintana, who's 0-4. He has 20 strikeouts on the year. Am I crazy to think that Quintana can get half of what he has this year in strikeouts against the Cards tonight? So 10, 10 strikeouts. 10 strikeouts tonight in one game? Yeah, you're crazy. I don't think he's got that kind of stuff. I think that if Quintana has himself a night of all nights, I think we're looking at like six, seven strikeouts. Yeah, man, you crazy. <laughs> I, I don't I don't see 10. I think like maybe five. I mean, how's he going to strike out the bottom of this order? Kisner, Mater, Fermin. <laughs> if you can't hey, strike Kiss those. Daddy is absolutely uh, raking I should, right I now. should not have thrown. Yeah, I the box sauce went two I, for four last night. Seriously. Which, they by did? the way, extended my beat the streak. Everyone was laughing at me. We did And then laugh. the mot sauce went two for four. Oh, my goodness. I forgot all about the mot sauce getting two hits last night.
Yeah, I don't see how you're getting enough 10 strikeouts when you got modern Fermin at the bottom of the order. That's a good point. All right, the gauntlet. Coming up next, we got a returning uh, contestant, a Greg, I believe, is coming back after Tanner pulled a Babe Ruth, called his shot, and, uh, well, I don't know, only got it to the warning track. Gauntlet coming up next here on 101 ESPN. Close counts. Brought to you by Master, your hometown source for business communications for more than 30 years. Visit Mastor.com. Welcome back inside the fast lane. It's gauntlet time here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers, Tanner Hendrickson, Andrew Marsh, man in the ship today. We've got a returning contestant, our guy Greg, who wiped the floor with Tanner yesterday. Greg, how we doing? <laughs> Doing all right. The afternoon guys wanted me to play him again. Is that possible? No, no. Tanner's still he's still <laughs> icing down from the beating yeah. he took yesterday. That warning track power. <laughs> At the right ballpark, it was gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, buddy. You know how this works. Who are you picking today? Uh, well, I'm going to go with you and hope I don't get hockey. All right, buddy. Okay, I'm going to duck out of here, head to the cone of silence. Uh, Marshy, you got the bus from here. All right, sounds good. Good luck, Greg. You forgot to call your shot, by the way. I'm smarter than that. <laughs> All right, Greg, you know the rules. You got to tell me to spin that wheel first. Yep, here we go. 
All right, what are you looking for today, Greg? Again, against Jamie, basically anything but hockey. Anything but hockey. All right. Well, today you are not getting hockey. You're, in fact, getting football. You okay with football? Football again. Football again. I'll All take right. Football. Yeah, you're one and zero with football. We don't gotta continue to relive. As you beat Tanner yesterday, he called his <laughs> shot yesterday, and you you took him down. So I'm gonna give Tanner the launch codes. We're gonna get this going. Are you ready, Greg? Round number two. I'm ready. Let's do it. Question number one: Which NFL team did former St. Louis Battlehawks receiver Hakeem Butler sign with in the off season? Give me the option. Options are the Eagles, the Steelers, or the Ravens. Sounds like a Steelers move. Final answer. All right. Greg, question number two. Which team eliminated the Minnesota Vikings in the wild card round of the playoffs last season? Oh, wild card last season. Cowboys, final answer. All right, question number three. What is the name of the Colts' recent first-round draft pick out of Florida, who they just named as their starting quarterback for game one of the upcoming season? Uh, Richardson. Is it Anthony Richardson? Final answer? Final answer. All right, question number four, Greg. Who is the most recent Heisman Trophy winner? Uh, Caleb, guy from USB. Caleb Caleb Williams? Yeah, it's the guy from USB, Caleb. Caleb Williams, like, damn it. Give me the options because I can't remember his last name. Is it Caleb Williams? Max Duggan or Bryce Young? Yeah, that first guy that I said. Caleb Williams. Final answer? Final answer. All right, let's bring Jamie back in from the cone of silence. He's talking with Mike Ryder. How are you feeling today, Greg? I think that last one there may have uh, hurt me. We'll see how it ends up shaking. Jamie. Oh, shaking? What? Yeah. How would my guy Greg do? Well, you better pack a lunch. Really? Yeah. That good, huh? Yep. And your category today is football. I love football. Two footballs oh, I in a row. I love football. All right, Greg. Bring that blank to me, man. <laughs> All right. Question number one, Jamie. Which NFL team did former St. Louis Battlehawks receiver Hakeem Butler sign with in the offseason? Oh, wasn't it the Steelers? I thought it was the Steelers. Son of a batch of biscuits. Give me the options, please. Options are the Eagles, the Steelers, Ah! or the Ravens. Steelers, final answer. All right, question number two. Which team eliminated the Minnesota Vikings in the wildcard round of the playoffs last season? Hmm. Why am I drawing a blank? Vikings. Ah, options. Was it the San Francisco 49ers, the New York Giants, or the Dallas Cowboys? It was the San Francisco 49ers. Final answer. Question number three. What is the name of the Colts' recent first-round draft pick out of Florida, who they just named as their starting quarterback for game one of the upcoming season? Oh, it's... uh. Richardson. Final answer. All right. And question number four. Who is the most recent Heisman Trophy winner? Oh, man. It's the USC quarterback. Why am I drawing a blank right now on his name? We just talked about this guy, too. Caleb Williams. Final answer. All right. Let's go over these. Head trauma is real, guys. (laughs) All right, let's just start with uh, question number one. Which NFL team did former St. Louis Battlehawks receiver Hakeem Butler sign with in the offseason? Greg, you said the Steelers. You used the options. Jamie, you used the options. You also said the Steelers. The correct answer is the Steelers. I should have. Son of a. 
Good job, Greg. So we're all tied up at one. Question number two. Which team eliminated the Minnesota Vikings in the wild card round of the playoffs last season? No options. Greg said the Cowboys. Jamie, you used the options. Oh, yeah. You said the San Francisco 49ers. The correct answer is... Danny Dimes and the New York Giants. Oh, was it really? That's why I don't like them all that much, Jamie, because they beat my they beat my Vikings. What is up with all these Viking questions? The reason you couldn't remember is because it's kind of a forgettable performance from Kirk Cousins again. That's oh a good point goodness. by you. School of Vikings. <laughs> Question number three. What is the name of the Colts' recent first-round draft pick out of Florida, who they just named as their starting quarterback for game one of the upcoming season? Greg, you said Anthony Richardson. Jamie, you also said Anthony Richardson. Correct answer is? Anthony Richardson. Yeah. But you both didn't need the options. We're all tied up at three. Last question. Who is the most recent Heisman Trophy winner? Greg, you said Caleb Williams. Jamie, you said Caleb Williams. The correct answer is? Caleb Williams. But Greg needed the options. Greg. You have chosen. <laughs> Holy. You lose. I love foosball, Greg. <laughs> go back. Go back and listen to what I did, and you'll think it's even funnier, Jamie. Oh, man. All right. We'll have Marshy pull that here oh, in the break. Uh, so the tough. That is. So tough for Greg. <laughs> I, I even said it, man. I even said I'm like, that last one's going to get me for what I just did. Oh, man. Well, look, man, a couple of good performances in the gauntlet, buddy. What are you, four points yesterday or today, and what did you have yesterday? Six? Six, four, six, five, five, yeah. four, something like that. Not too bad. No, great job, my man. Well, look, we appreciate you playing, and we certainly appreciate you listening. Yep, uh, you guys do a great job, and uh, we'll, I'll be uh, going to work here shortly, but I'll be listening again tomorrow morning. All right, man, All we day. appreciate Happy it. Every day. Take care of yourself, buddy. Have a good one. Bye. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Greg's a nice guy. I yeah. know. How does it feel? Oh, great. I don't care. I bury the bodies. That's uh, me. I don't I, care. I feel bad for Greg. I don't. Greg knows I don't, and Greg appreciates that. Because he wouldn't feel bad. Yeah, if right he, now Greg was tap dancing on my forehead, he'd feel mm, just fine. Yeah, he didn't feel bad about beating no, me yesterday. No, no. He, in fact, he came back, he wanted more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> right? I'm surprised that you're not overly excited for Jamie because obviously Greg beat you yesterday. Well, you know. In the same category. Knowing what happened to Greg. That is I, true. I, Jamie, he, okay. He goes... I th it's Caleb. I can't think of the last name, and I know this is going to bite me. Well, no, he actually I need the said options. his name. He oh, yeah, said he did it, say his he name, said too. It, I think it's Caleb Williams, but, man, I can't remember. I'm going to need the options. Oh, uh, I've done that before, and too. And then first option, Caleb Williams. I thought you were going to ask for the option, too, because you said, oh, I'm drawing a blank. It's I like, was. Uh -oh. I could see USC, and I, I could see the player, but I was like, and we have been talking about him quite a bit recently. Yeah, yeah. And I just, the hamster was just frozen in his wheel. And then all of a sudden, he, like, woke up and started to run, and I got it, so. That was a quick gauntlet, too. I, well, I was sitting there with Ryder and with Grant, and. Wait, did Grant let you sit in the cone of silence? Oh, yeah, he knows better. Wow. And I had my feet up, actually, and we were talking about just whatever, Grant's new car. And all of a sudden, you guys are waving me in. I'm like, what the? I'm like, that either went really good or really bad for mm -hmm. Greg. Well, it did go bad at the end, yeah. so. It was a good performance, it was you a good know? performance. Better than mine. Well, speaking of performances, guys, uh, Adam oh, Wainwright geez. has got a big game tonight. Um, if things go poorly for Wainwright tonight, one, what do you do with him? And two, if you move him to the bullpen, who's the next guy in line for the rotation? We'll talk about that next here in the Fast Lane on 101 ESPN.
Well, I think some of the discussions are, well, should we pitch him? Should we not pitch him? This and that. But you know what? Those discussions mean nothing now because the Cardinals aren't going anywhere. Why not give him the opportunity to get 200 wins? That's what I would do because now if you're in a pennant race, that might be a little bit of a different story. And I know you got to make sure the fans know that you're trying to win baseball games. Well, Adam Wainwright knows how to win baseball games. It's a matter of, you know, a little bit uh, uh, execution on his part. But I would give him the ball every fifth day and uh, try to get him to that level of 200 wins and uh, and call it a career. Only because they have nothing to get, they have nothing to lose. All right, that was Leo Mazzoni, uh, former Braves pitching coach. Uh, he joined us earlier on the fast lane at three o'clock. If you missed any of that interview, you can always go back, download the podcast. Brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto. Okay, guys. So here's the thing, Adam Wainwright. This this is like a monumental start for Wayno. Out of all the big games he's pitched and all the things that um, have happened in his career, I feel like there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on this start, mostly because things have not gone the way that Adam Wainwright or anybody in Cardinal Nation would have wanted for, for Wayno. But if things go poorly again tonight, if it's, a, if it's a tough outing for Adam Wainwright, what do you do? And if you send him to the bullpen, who comes into the rotation? T-Bone, you're, you're Ollie Marmol slash John Mosellock all mixed into one person right now, okay? What are you doing? So if he has another bad outing and it's non-competitive, which I think is fair to say of the last two against Kansas City and the Colorado Rockies, where he couldn't even get through four innings, um, I think he's going to the bullpen. And I think he's going to take the role of what you saw, what Casey Lawrence did last night, where it is, hey, the game's kind of out of hand. We just need someone to go in and try and eat innings for us. Then I, I think you put Wayno in that role if it's not competitive again. Um, the hope would be that it's not, and I hope it's not, so we don't have to have that conversation tomorrow on air. Um, but if he struggles tonight, and it is as bad as it has been the last two outings, I think you push him to the bullpen, and I think you look to call up either Drew Rahm, Gordon Graceffo, Michael McGreevy, one of these young arms, kind of bring them up because you need to start seeing what you have in those guys and what they look like at the big league level. Now, McGreevy, Graceffo, they'd have to select the contract on. They're not on the 40-man roster. Mm -hmm. And we know how tight this 40-man roster is, so that might be tough sledding. But Drew Rahm is on the 40-man, so they could just call him up. He's looked really good. His two outings in AAA, he's got, I think, like 16 strikeouts is what the lefty is, so he's interesting to uh, see, and I'd like to see him at the big leagues. Doesn't throw hard. That's why he's kind of an interesting character. But I think if it goes south again, I think they have to look to put Wayno into the bullpen. So that's where I was at um, leading into today. But then listening to Leo Mazzoni talk about how it doesn't matter anymore. And, and I say that, you know, in, with air quotes, doesn't matter. The Cardinals are out of it. They're not going to be able to make a playoff push here. They're not going to be able to really make some noise coming down the stretch and even if they win, you know, a handful of games, is it ultimately going to be the difference? I feel like Adam Wainwright should just get the ball. Just every five days you give Wayno the ball and you hope for a different result. Now, I know that that's the definition of insanity. Call me insane, then. Call me insane for giving the ball to Adam Wainwright, who deserves every opportunity that we can possibly afford him to get to 200 wins. Uh, Leo did explain how, you know, you're relying on a lot of other factors if you're pulling him out of the bullpen to try and get him those two wins, you're, you're relying on your team coming back or, or pulling ahead. You're relying on other pitchers following him. Like, there's a lot. There's more to it, I think. So I, I think it gets tricky. I'm of the belief now that you just ride it out with Wayno and see, you know, kind of where it goes. Now, our guy BK uh, was talking about if for some reason Wayno went to the bullpen, you know, who would the next guy in line be for the rotation? Here's what BK had to say. I look at what Drew Rom did. Uh, he, he pitched again last night in his two starts for the Cardinals in the minors. He's gone uh, 11 innings, allowed two hits, two earned runs, has struck out 18, and has walked just four. He is the guy that they got in the, um, in the Jack Flaherty deal with <clears throat> the Baltimore Orioles. I have no idea if what he does is going to work at the big league level. No clue. I don't know how anybody could possibly tell you with any sort of definitive statements that it will. But, man, it looks good right now down in, in AAA. 
he is a guy that throws like 90 miles an hour. He's got some pretty deceptive stuff. It's a good spin rate on it. He's 23 years old. I'd like to find out the rest of the way if that works. All right. So, Tanner, you you brought up Drew Rom. What is it about him that you like? He, so he throws 90. He's for, somehow has swing and miss stuff while throwing 90, which I don't fully understand. But as you heard BK say there, he's got deceptive stuff. One thing I've, I've seen some of his highlights from his two starts in Memphis, his delivery in terms of like uh, how he delivers the baseball to home plate looks kind of like what Jay Happ looked like when he was here. Everybody's favorite. Um, and then he's got a little bit, and I'm not saying he is this player, but he's got a little Nestor Cortez to him, not in terms of what his stuff is, but he likes to change that arm angle a lot. And he's a left-handed pitcher. So well, he'll throw that fast kind of up over the top he'll throw the slider out of that slot too and then sometimes just to change the look of things he'll th drop the arm angle down and fling the slider across that way too so he's interesting and, and as you heard BK say there he was acquired in a trade and the thing for me with Adam Wainwright as much as I would like to say yeah keep throwing him out there keep throwing him out there just get to 200 wins At some point you have to weigh the future of the organization too and this is his last year and I think you just have to go okay we have to figure out what we have in some of these arms We're, we don't want to be in this situation again in Cardinals baseball typically isn't in this situation where these games don't really matter. There's no significant implication for them in terms of the playoffs to where they can have an opportunity to throw out young arms like a Libertor, a Thompson, um, a Dakota Hudson right now. I think you add another arm into that and see what you have. And I, if you're not going to do Drew Rahm, I'd like to see what Michael McGreevy is. He's had a really good year down in Memphis. Gordon Graceffel had a really good outing last night in Memphis. So I would want to see one of those arms because if it's non-competitive again for Adam Wainwright, I'm just not sure if it's going to get to the point where it is competitive. And at that point, you're just really burning a bullpen consistently when he goes out there to where you have to carry three long relievers like they are right now. And again, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we're not having that kind of conversation tomorrow when we come on the air. I hope the conversation is, hey, it did work. It worked for Adam Wainwright. He got win number 199, or he was really close to getting win 199, and you can keep him in the rotation. But if it goes poorly, I think he's got to go to the bullpen. Yeah, okay, so this is assuming that the Cardinals decide to move Wayno to the bullpen. And so hypothetically, who would be our guy for the rotation? I have said this before, and I don't think it's crazy. A couple reasons is, one, finding 40-man roster spots is not an issue. You have a real good handful of guys that you could DFA without losing sleep over. Like there's, who? There's, the list goes on and on, T-Bone. You and BK and you guys went over it the other day, and I couldn't believe how many guys are on the 40-man that I've never even heard of before. Like Rishi Palacios, who's now here? Well, no, not him. Huh. Uh, he's actually a guy that can kind of fill in. But there are other guys that don't have a sniff of playing this year, and you could DFA them easily. So my thought is... Drew Rahm would be the first one to get a chance to come up and get a start. And then every five days, I'd have a different guy. Every five days, it would be one of the young guys. So then McGreevy's the next start. Graceffo's the next start. Kind of rotate it around a little bit. One, not that you're going to uncover something that's miraculous out of these guys, but it gets them some big league reps. It gives them some innings on the bump here at Bush Stadium, wherever the heck they're playing. Why not? And all it could do is is kind of springboard them a little bit into the off season, and then you have a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a scouting report, internally anyways, of what you've got heading into spring training next year. Yeah, I, I don't mind that at all because I, I would like to see, and it's tough because it is just kind of that one rotation spot that we're talking about, but I do kind of want to see a Drew Rahm. I do kind of want to see Michael McGreevy. I do want to kind of see Gordon Graceffo. Honestly, I'm okay if those guys come up and they don't really serve as – um, starters or even long relievers, but they come in and you kind of go the route you did when you had Lance Lynn when he came up through the system where it was or that Adam first Wayne year. Right. Yeah, he came up he came up and he was in the bullpen in the month of September. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that. And I don't want to see it where he's a long man and you see him only once or twice. Have him come in and have him pitch just an inning. Have him pitch an inning, you know, two times a week. And that way you get to at least see them. And though it isn't as a starter, it's just because you've run out of starting spots you can't run out there eight starters you're not going to run an eight-man rotation maybe you could revert to a six-man rotation in the month of september just well, so you can throw another you. guy would you go to a six-man like, if you, if you don't want to take wayno out of the rotation would you go to a six-man i would do a six-man without wayno in the rotation if i'm being honest because then i get to see two young arms yeah 
compared to just one if Wayno struggles again the big caveat tonight um so if they go to a six man i still don't think Wayno would be in it I, I think he would be just kind of in the bullpen serving as a long man potentially to help out one of these kids if they do struggle kind of piggyback with them he could piggyback a michael mcgreevy he could piggyback a true rom so if, if they go to a six-man rotation i wouldn't be opposed to it because again you get to see a lot of these young guys and these younger guys like mcgreevy graceffo uh, Rom that we're talking about, they operate in a six-man rotation down in the minor leagues. They don't. They don't do a five-man rotation down in the minors. They do a six six-man rotation all year long. As it pertains to Adam Wainwright, could you also see him maybe not wanting to go into the bullpen, but they also don't want him to be a starter? So then he goes on the IL. No, I don't see for that. an X amount of time, and then maybe late September they bring him back. He pitches his final few games at Bush Stadium, and then he calls it a career. I don't see that one. Um, I just I, I feel wanna, like going I, to the bullpen is such a demotion like that. So might, being fraudulently put on the IL isn't. He already has been, I think. In this I know, year. but right now he's talking about every day how great he feels and how things are good and how he's like not feeling the way he did earlier this season. That could change in one pitch tonight. I know. I don't like you lying to our listeners. Okay. I don't You're like lying. lying. What Cardinal is that? Nation is built upon trust and honesty. Yeah. I don't like where your head's at right now. You're right. What go, was I thinking? Go sit in timeout. I'll go, I'll go to the cone of silence. There you go. Please. Tanner, you can take over. All right. Adam Wainwright yep. gets the start tonight for the St. Louis Cardinals. Tanner, for you, what does his start have to look like in order to keep him in five days from now? Uh, there's no numbers for me that I are. I want numbers. Oh, gosh. You're the numbers guy. I, I, to me, I'm not looking at numbers. I'm looking at how competitive the outing is. I would say if he goes four or five innings, and allows like three to five runs. To me, that's still somewhat competitive. Five runs. Competitive? Somewhat. Wow. More competitive than You're one forgiving. inning and eight earned runs. You're forgiving. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to keep him in the rotation. <laughs> um, but I, I, to me, it's just how how competitive does it look? Because the last two outings just haven't looked competitive. I, I mean, it's it's just to the point where it's like you feel so bad for him that he's out there. If he can at least go five innings can qualify for the win potentially maybe it's four innings he kind of works out of trouble the trouble ends up bringing up the pitch count and he allows like three earned runs that's a competitive out you can build off of that mm -hmm. so i that's what i'm looking for tonight if it's one inning two innings and it's eight earned runs like that that's the point where it is okay pull the plug we've got to just put him in the bullpen he can't he can't continue to start for us for me it's four or five innings three earned runs or less and that gets way his next start We'll find out tonight. Cardinals play the New York Mets. Adam Wainwright on the bump. We've got NFL up next with top five sneaky Super Bowl contenders here on 101 ESPN.
Center. I'm Andrew Marsh. It's time for a Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The cards fall to the Oakland Athletics last night by a final score of eight to nothing. Matthew Libertor went four and a third, gave up ten hits, five earned runs, and walked three. Adam Wainwright, who we just discussed last segment, he will take on Jose Quintana and the New York Mets tonight. 6-15, first pitch on Fox. We talked earlier today with Matt Holliday and Leo Mazzoni. If you missed those interviews, make sure you go to 101ESPN.com or check out the 101 mobile app. It's all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. We have our top five sneaky Super Bowl contenders coming up next. If you want to chime in to the Air Comfort Service text line, let us know who your top five are. You can text 314-399-9646. That's coming, on, that's coming your way next right here in the fast lane. I'm Andrew Marsh, and the Sports Center update is driven by Johnny Londoff. Find new roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? here on 101 ESPN. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jeweler is 434. All right, boys, our top five sneaky Super Bowl contenders. So, Marshy, is this sneaky or is it just outright who we think? Because I, I put it down in order of who, we, who I think can win it. So I, I did sneaky. I did some bottom tier teams, not like the okay. third tier, but maybe, you know, a team that was on the cusp of being a playoff team last year, mm -hmm. maybe a playoff team last year, but they, you know, didn't really do much in the playoffs or uh, potentially a team that has a lot of hype this season uh, based on some moves that they made. That's how I did it. Okay. Of course, we can go however no. you want to as well. We're good. I I have that list uh, compiled here. I'm just missing one, which I can put together in a jiffy. All right. So, all right. With fr without further ado, number five, T-Bone. What do you got? I've got the Jacksonville Jaguars as kind of number five. Mm. I think they're a team that we kind of talked about. It. They should cruise through their division in the a AFC South, but every nobody's looking at them as a Super Bowl contender. Why? Because you've got Kansas City, you've got Cincinnati, you've got Josh Allen out there as well. I think Jacksonville's a sneaky good team. Trevor Lawrence, if he takes another step forward, they're a team that could potentially go on a run in the AFC. All right, Marshy? Uh, I, I have Minnesota in here. They don't get a ton of uh, credit for just how good their, you know, their team is. Of course, their, their defense is not great last year, but they're a playoff team. Uh, I think they could be a sneaky Super Bowl contender, uh, but I'm not going to put them at number one, even though I wish I could. I have them at number five. All right. Uh, I have the Miami Dolphins at number five. Now, not super sneaky under the radar, but everything hinges on Tua, quite honestly. Can he stay healthy? Can he be the quarterback that he was the first half of the season last year? If he can, this team is a contender. If he can't, well, then they're just going to be passengers again. So I've got the Dolphins at, at number five. Number four. All right, number four on my list, I've got the L.A. Chargers. I think they belong in the sneaky category. Again, because nobody's talking about them in the AFC. Their coach stinks. But if Staley can get out of his own way, they stay healthy offensively. Justin Herbert's arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Top four, I would say. And if you have a top four quarterback, you're always going to be a team that can sneak into the Super Bowl conversation. So I'm going to say the L.A. Chargers at number four for me. Number four, I have the Denver Broncos. They were awful last season. One of the worst teams ever coached, according to their head coach, <laughs> Sean Payton. I've heard a lot of good things about Cortland Sutton. I think Sean Payton can uh, at least bring this team to be a playoff contender at minimum. Uh, but I could see them maybe contending for a Super Bowl as well. Uh, but I have them at number four. 
All right, I've got the Jacksonville Jaguars at four. Uh, Trevor Lawrence building upon a really good season last year, second year with a really good head coach. Got some, she's got some help with Calvin Ridley joining the lineup. Uh, they've got some weapons there. I feel like this team is ready to take that next step. They were really close last year, uh, and, and so I'm going with the Jacksonville Jaguars at number four. Number three. Number three for me, I've got the Miami Dolphins. Same reason that you just said uh, earlier. If Tua is healthy, they've got one of the best offenses in the league, and they went all in at the deadline last year trying to acquire some more defensive pieces. They traded for Jalen Ramsey this offseason. Now, he's hurt. He's going to miss time. But they're trying to go all in on that defense and try and help it to build it around the offense. Tua stays healthy. Watch out. He goes down with an injury, though. Then everything's going to be just in fritz again for him like it was last year. At number three, I have Derek Carr driving his motorcycle or riding his motorcycle (laughs) all the way back to Las Vegas for the Super Bowl. He's my uh, third pick. I think the NFC South is awful. Just a terrible division, uh, no matter what Anthony says. But uh, the Saints, I think they are the best team in that division. I think they'll just cruise on into the playoffs. And, you know, once you're in, anything can happen. All right. I've got the Bears. The Chicago Bears, this is a reach. Let me tell you, it's top shelf way up there. I'm on my tippy toes and I am reaching. But, dot, 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 if Justin Fields can play the way he's been hyped, that team is better. That team is better. Now they're going to have to run a gauntlet through that NFC North, right, Marshy? The Vikings, Anthony's Packers. Yeah, Lions. that guy is Anthony is a fan of every single team in the in the NFL. <laughs> At some point, he will be a fan of every single team in the NFL. Can he really defend the commanders, though? No, or that's Cardinals. That team. Well, he did have the Carson Wentz socks. He did have those. So yeah. I think he has a new team, a new like like nah, let's say seven teams every year. <laughs> <laughs> this year he has obviously you have the Falcons are always going to be there, but you have the Saints, the 49ers, the Packers. The Packers is the one that's got me kind of. Yeah, I don't befuddled. know. He must be a huge Jordan Love fan. Yeah, he's all about it. this. Jordan Love's gonna be way better than you think. Well, anyway, sir, I don't have high expectations. Sure, he might reach that reach that bar. <laughs> it's true. It depends where you set the bar. Well, I've got the Bears in at number three for myself. Number two. Number four, two for me. I'm biting some kneecaps. I think it's the Detroit oh, Lions. I, wow. Jared Goff has gotten to a Super Bowl before, so he knows what it takes to get there. And when, he's a quarterback, though. When he doesn't have weapons around him, good luck. He looks terrible. But he can play with weapons around him. That Detroit Lions offense is going to be good again. So I think they're a team that can be sneaky good. They've got decent defense. So I'm saying Detroit Lions, watch out for them. In the NFC, that's just awful outside of Philadelphia. <laughs> I think they could get to the Super Bowl. Now, I left the Lions off my list just because of the hype that they, oh, wow. they, that they have. Have, you know this season so I don't consider them a sneaky Super Bowl contender because a lot of people have them winning the NFC North uh, that's why I put Minnesota in there just because um, a lot of people don't think they're going yeah. to win I had the Seattle Seahawks a lot of people high on San Francisco I've been big on the Seahawks even dating back to last year uh, with Geno Smith and uh, what Pete Carroll has going on up there in Seattle so I had them at number two All right. Uh, For me, at number two, I've got the Chargers. I got the Chargers. I think, look, Justin Herbert's an absolute stud quarterback. I I think the Chargers have a really good team. Now, the biggest question mark the Chargers have is their head coach. Mm -hmm. It's their head coach. And if he can put together a good season and kind of stay out of his own way, this is a team that can compete. Now, look, the AFC is, a, I mean, that's a tough conference for sure. And the AFC West is obviously going to be a tough division too with Marshy's new Denver Broncos that are going to be winning oh, the Super Bowl. Um, but yeah, no, I've got Justin Herbert and the Los Angeles Chargers at number two. Number one. Number one, the LA Rams. Oh my God. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. They're going to suck. I was uh, like, wait a minute. No, but I'm going to stick in that division, though, and it's the Seahawks for me at number one. Oh, oh, oh. Let that hawk fly, baby. <laughs> Geno Smith, 
Yeah, well, he's probably one of their bigger question marks, but I love the offense. I mean, Lockett, DK Metcalf, their first round pick from Ohio State's going to be good. And then you look at the defense. Their biggest question on defense is can they stop the run? That's where they got attacked a lot last year. Bringing in Bobby Wagner should help with that. He was awesome for the Rams last year in doing so. So I really like this team. I think they're winning the NFC West over the San Francisco 49ers. The team is getting all the hype in the NFC West. And I think if things go right, Geno plays well. They've got the offense to where they could be pushing everybody in the NFC to get to the Super Bowl. Oh, Sean McVay is the best playbook. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one, I have the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, they have made leaps and bounds from where they were when Urban Meyer was there. And Trevor Lawrence, I thought, looked great last season. They have Calvin Ridley, who's entered into the fold. They have a ton of weapons. Um, and they have a, a Super Bowl winning head coach. So I think they're in a pretty easy division. Uh, maybe not as easy as the NFC South, but the AFC South is, in my opinion, another easy division. And I think that they can make the playoffs win that division. Uh, not as close as it was last year with Tennessee. I think Tennessee takes a step back. It seems like they've been on the, the downturn over the past couple of years. So I'm going with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Hear me roar, boys. The Detroit Lions in at number one for me. And uh, contrary to Marshy says surrounding the hype and all that, they still weren't a playoff team last year. Yeah. And so based upon that, uh, them getting to the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl, for me is kind of a sneaky under the radar type thing because the natural progression would be to you know get into the playoffs and take the baby steps the sneaky unbelievably good season would be to get to the super bowl so i got dan campbell jared goff and all those other lions in there we got a text from the 636 and we appreciate everyone who was chiming in uh, a lot of the teams that we mentioned are also uh being texted in but uh, one that we did not mention none of us was the cleveland browns we got a text from 636 Deshaun Watson made an all pro team. How can you not even give the Browns a number five? I get the division, but it's Watson. If Watson returns to form, it's an easy pick. He dragged a horrible Texans team to the playoffs. He's also 27. He was also on the all terrible team last year, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was not good when he was on the field. So mm -hmm. I I don't I don't think Watson's going to get back to the level he was at when he was with the Houston Texans, and that's why I don't take them. I, I think they're the third best team in their division, and I could listen to an argument on where Pittsburgh could surpass them. So yeah. I, I just can't see them. And the reason I like, I love Jacksonville. I love the Chargers. I love the Miami Dolphins and their offenses. Mm -hmm. The reason I didn't have them as high in my top two is because the AFC is loaded. Yeah, and exactly. No matter how much you massage the Browns, it's just not happening. They're not getting into the playoffs mm -hmm. this year. All right, uh, 314-399-9646. That's the Air Comfort Service text line. We've got your sports six-pack next here on 101 ESPN.
It's time for the Fast Lane to answer your sports questions. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I want to have them answered immediately. Asking me all these weird questions. Answer the question. Answer the question. Answer me! The Sports Six Pack is refreshed by Mackie O'Brien's. Your go-to Irish pub in St. Louis for over 42 years. Welcome back to the Fast Lanes 101 ESPN. It's time for your sports six pack. Question number one. From the 618, one of the most famous sports fights of all time was Malice at the Palace. Jamie, how much fun would you have uh, ha- uh, if you got the opportunity to punch one of the unruly fans right in the face? Oh, wow. Well, I got a good story for you. I was playing junior hockey up in oh, Sudbury, Ontario. Where they filmed Shorzy, by the mm, way. Season two coming out here <laughs> Season soon. two coming out. They announced mm-hmm. that today. I saw that. Uh, looking forward to that. So anyways, we, we played in Oshawa, Ontario. And all these sounds are like, what the hell? The Oshawa Generals. The Oshawa Generals. Let's go, you Jennies. They'd scream that. And be like, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, me and this guy named Bob McIsaac were uh, both in the penalty box at the same time. He was my defense partner. He was from a town called Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Mm. Just rolls it off the tongue. I mean, is that close to where Al McKinnis grew up? Yes. Okay. Not too far. And this small town had some of the toughest guys I've ever played with or against coming out of this town. I think they all just fought each other. And then when they left, they just became like tough guys all around junior hockey. But anyways, we're sitting there in the penalty box in Oshawa early in the game. And this fan is just like giving it to Bobby nonstop, giving it to me nonstop. We get through the penalty, we get back on the ice, you know, come back there. Somehow, some way, later in the third period, we both end up back in the penalty box again. And uh, this guy's just yelling and yelling. And uh, Bobby says, hey, I'm going to go kick the crap out of that guy. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, he's got his skates on, right? No, there's no way. Now, in Oshawa, they had a little gap there. They had a security guard that stood there, but there was a gap. And so I look over, and all of a sudden, Bobby has his skates off, and he goes—he's running up the stairs. He f- goes right through the security guard, running up the stairs to go fight this fan. Oh my so now I'm tearing through my skates, trying to get them off to go help Bobby. I get him off. I'm running up there. The cops are grabbing me. They're grabbing Bobby. The fans are hitting us with things. Now our teammates are going over to the penalty box, trying to figure out how they can help us. But you'd have to take your skates off. Anyways, nothing serious happened. There was nobody hurt in all of it. Nobody went to jail. Cops were a little pissed off at Bobby and I, but uh, it, that reminded me of that a little bit to where um, you have a chance to get after somebody, but it should stay on the ice. It should stay on the court. It should stay on the field. Players shouldn't be fighting fans, but fans on the other hand shouldn't be taking advantage of it either. 100% agree. Question number two. From a 314, I'm starting to get a little concern about Nolan Gorman. Should this be a concerning issue or am I overreacting? Hmm. T Bone, what do you think? It's never reassuring to hear anything about a back issue. Um, and it sounds like this is a thing that they've known about since I can't remember what it said today, 2020 or 2021, where he heard it during weightlifting. So I'm not sure. Is he working out with Tyler O'Neill? Yeah, probably. Now that, now that I think about it, <laughs> unlike Tyler, though, he's been playing through it. Um, I, but when I look at when I when I when I hear that, it is a little concerning. But it's not like flashing red alarm bells because he's been playing through it most mm-hmm. of the year. It, it, if he's going to have to start taking off like a game or two, like he's, I know he's going on the IL now. But there's been times this year where he gets scratched from the lineup, misses two games, and then he's back and he plays for like two weeks, and then maybe has to sit out another day or two. That, that's a little concerning, but the Cardinals know that, so they should be able to kind of build around that. So I, I'm not overly concerned, just a little bit, but it's not too bad. I'm not too concerned. He's so young, you know, that I think that uh, maybe you shut him down for a bit here this year. If, I, if you're the Cardinals, I'm playing it really safe. Based on the fact that this guy has the ability to be a game changer with one swing of a bat, I'm playing it safe. I don't care. Give him extra rest. It doesn't matter. You're not in a division race, a pennant race, nothing. I want this kid to get healthy. If you have to shut him down for the rest of the season and get him absolutely 100% right for next year, you do it. Now, I think that's dramatic. You know, I think that that, that's a lot, but you get my drift here. I think you let this kid heal. I'm not too worried about it. Young bodies heal really fast. 
Question number three. From 314, what is more fascinating to you, deep sea or deep space? Hmm. I think deep sea for me. And the reason I say deep sea is because we have way more record of kind of what's going on down there. And recently we have like discovered things that we thought were gone forever and they're not, they're down there. So I'm intrigued by that. I'm also horrified by the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Be like swimming along and see like a megalodon or yeah. something. I know that's <laughs> you just exaggerating. Need Jason Statham to uh, <laughs> yeah, right. take him with ride you. Ride on a, a jet ski and jump off and kick it in the face. So there was one. I saw something today on Twitter slash X, whatever the hell this thing is, is a manta ray. They had this manta ray in the ocean that popped up out of nowhere. It's a giant manta ray. And a shark was swimming with it. The shark looked like a pilot fish. You know those little fish that like <laughs> suck on the back of the fishes? The, the, <laughs> it looked like one of those on the size of this thing. And I was like, okay, those are not supposed to be around anymore. And that thing was massive. So deep sea, for me, intrigues me more than deep space because I'm like, I don't even know if there's anything out there. That's kind of where I am too, is the fact that I don't know if there's anything out there makes me think that it wouldn't be all that exciting you don't so, think there's anything out, i'm i'm on the deep space team really yes oh i love space do you yes okay i you don't think there's anything out there not i don't know i i mean i would i know there's something in the ocean and i'm one of those guys that like certainty so yeah. i know i'm gonna see something when i go to the deep sea because I'd maybe 50-50 at best. If I'm going to see something in deep space, I'm just going to take the 100% certainty. I don't know. I. By the way, if people are wondering what the heck I'm talking about, go to Dark Side of Nature on Twitter and you scroll down to August 13th and they got the video of this thing swimming around and the shark literally looked like a minnow on this thing's back. Oh, my Look at this thing, Tanner. Watch this. The shark is coming in here. Look at it. It's impressive. So go check that out. That's why uh, things like that intrigue me and horrify me all at the same time. I watched Interstellar last night, so maybe oh, go. Space Boys back. Maybe I'm leaning like more space. towards space and like <laughs> giant wormholes and, and you have, black holes and all that. Did you have your ayahuasca before you watched that? No, I should have though. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> Question number four. Jamie, you had a question for the sports six-pack that you wanted to get to. Yeah, I I don't know if this is a question or it could be the great debate. It could be the debate of all ages. So when I was growing up, and I think through any era of time, if you you were riding a moped, it was considered to be kind of dorky, okay? And they weren't weren't cool looking, but they looked like bikes did kind of back then. And if your buddies or whatever or anybody saw you riding a moped, they'd be like, oh, what a loser. <laughs> Yet here we are, and e-bikes are like the thing now. Mm-hmm. So in essence, is driving a moped now cool? I mean, probably, considering that we shouldn't ride motorcycles. That one, Tanner. No, there's a cutoff. You can ride yeah, a motorcycle. You can. Oh. You're still young. Enough. Oh, that's right. That's right. No, but seriously, everybody used to laugh at the electronic bike, the basically the moped, and now they're everywhere, absolutely everywhere, and they're cool and they're but I don't, you know trendy. I guess what I would say is I don't know if I see people riding them. Well, I guess those are electric scooters. I was thinking of those things that you see like downtown that like people the birds. hop on. Yeah, birds. Like. Yeah. I guess Go that's around not New York exactly City, though, about. and all those places, there's tons of these e-bikes everywhere. Those little delivery guys are zipping around on e-bikes everywhere. I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're cool though, because I don't know if I can like say like I, I know don't... anybody that's really like, hey man, I got me a moped. I, I haven't know. had that conversation. I'm yeah, I don't know if that's maybe I'm not caught up on the times. But I see them and they're like they're going for like twenty five hundred, three grand for a mountain bike that has a little motor on it. And I'm like, you're right, you're so right. Is, is it a moped or is it like a what looks like a bicycle, but it has like a little kick to it because it's motorized? Well, it's it's a bicycle that has a little kick to it, but all things are relative here because the moped was designed after bikes that looked like that back in the day. Because mopeds look goofy, so I consider yeah, the them to be goofy. Too. Trust if me, it looks like up, a bike, I'm more inclined to do like, it. Are we probably. talking about like a mongoose bike or yes, something like that? Okay, I could see that being somewhat cool. You know? So anyways, that was it's just been perplexing because I was like, all those times everybody laughed at the kids riding around on a moped, and now it's like cool to ride an electronic or electric bike. Anyways, that was my question. 
I'm sorry. Text line. I am. <laughs> Uh, the text I, I, I'm glad great. they said it because I was thinking that's the analytics department that might be on one. <laughs> Jamie, I'm with you, but are you seriously asking Tanner what is cool? <laughs> Come on, T-Bone. Don't take that. Yeah, what's up with that 314? Right? I'm a 23-year-old hip kid. Apparently, mopeds have made a comeback on college campuses, too. I can see that. Mm-hmm. Kind of. Tanner, what would you consider to be cool? What's what's hip in the? I know we're a few years apart, but how, we're in different how far generations. Apart are we? What five, four or five years? So you're part of a different generation. I'm I'm the last of the millennial generation. What would I consider to be cool? Well, moped clearly on top of that list. Um, all right, I guess I'm not cool <laughs> since I can't really think of anything <laughs> off the top of my head. Question number five. All right, guys, from the 618, since I'm heading to the game today, what is the best spot to get fr- food from at Bush Stadium? Oh, T-Bone, aren't you a little bit of a food connoisseur down there at Bush Stadium? I stick to the ball- ballpark food. Now, I know they have a Same, lot of... That's kind of what I do. Like, they got salt and smoke and all these awesome places down there. But I always go for, like, the ballpark dog... And I always get the nachos, too. I go nachos. No, Alberto nachos, I believe is what it's called. That's I, my spot. Is that your spot? Marshy, you were down there just recently. Yeah, I usually go for the uh, the bacon-wrapped hot dog. I know they have the jumbo dog, and that's what I got last time. But bacon wrapped, the bacon-wrapped hot dog is is my go-to. I so think how it's, does that one work? Do it, it take... Is it they just take the bacon yeah, just, and wrap it around the wiener? It's just they take the bacon, they wrap the they wrap the the pork around the wiener, and, mm-hmm. and then they serve it to you. And they can put and you some, like that, huh? I like it a lot. You can put some condiments on it, I uh, use some them. different sauces. Yeah. Um, you like your bacon wrapped tightly around it or no? No, I don't like anything on it. Just oh, not even bear. bacon. I like it bare. Okay, yeah. I mean, whatever floats your boat, you know. Uh-huh. So, all uh, right, yeah. Next, please. <laughs> Question number six. <laughs> we have question six? Or are we are we done? Let's just, let's just be done. <laughs> All right. That was the sports six pack here Jeez. in the fast lane on 101 ESPN. We'll see if our guy Marshy can recover for what's trending next.
trending in the world of sports? The Fast Lane has you covered. What's trending now? Brought to you by Goodwill. Donate to Goodwill and get a half price Cardinals ticket voucher. Welcome back to the Fast Lane here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers, Tanner Hendrickson filling in for our guy Anthony Stalter. I'm Andrew Marsh, and it's time for What's Trending. Guys, Kevin Brown, who was in the news for being suspended because of the Orioles owner not liking what he had to say. Uh, what was that, a few weeks back, mm-hmm. talking about the Tampa Bay Rays? Well, he's back in the news, oh, but no. he's talking music, fellas. And he brought up one of my favorite bands, in Blink-182, take a listen to the broadcast between the Orioles and the Padres. By the way, the Padres were winning 10 to nothing, so this typically happens when uh, you have nothing to talk about. <laughs> don't tell me you don't know Blink-182. I'll be honest, never heard of Blink-182. Are you kidding me? Sounds like a fighter jet to me. Let's get out of here. You don't know Blink-182? Mm-mm. I probably know the song. Yeah. All the small things? No, sing it for me. All I might recognize it. Small things. <laughs> oh, okay, don't sing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Say it ain't so. Tom DeLong has had a lot of Padres games. Big fan. I miss you. You don't know that one? I don't think so. I mean, I might if I could hear the song. Tom has this, like, very distinct nasally voice. You know? So he goes, where are you? And I'm so sorry. Now I recognize you. You do. You yeah, got you it sound now. Just Thank like you. Yeah. Yeah, about time. <laughs> That's great. One, Jamie, could you see you and John Kelly doing something like this? Because uh, I feel like you have that personality where you just bring up stuff, especially if the Blues are in a spot where maybe they're losing, let's say, 5-1. Mm, it's not yeah. a good game. Yeah, no, I definitely listen. John Kelly actually has a really good sense of humor. He, he I loved, gonna go singing voice. N- well, maybe I haven't heard him sing yet. Maybe he's got the voice of an angel. Yeah, let us know. You never know. Be out of bars doing karaoke on the road this but, year. Yeah, you never know. But JK is funny, man. He he loves to laugh, loves to have a good time, and he would play along with that. I mean, John Kelly's such a you know, straight laced guy. You know, very serious. I find that that would be a funny interaction. But you know what's hilarious about that whole thing there? That's a guy that just doesn't want to talk about the game at no, that point. No. If he brings up the fact that the Padres are up 10-0, that'll cost you another week, buddy. <laughs> Don't you dare <laughs> tell our fans that we're losing or that we have lost to a team in the past. He still might get suspended. He might be because the owner might be like, I don't like Blake 182. Can't you spin the game positive for us? <laughs> well, think about it. He just brought a ton of attention to himself. I saw this last night. It was on MLB Fox, like the, the Twitter account. And I would have had no idea that the Orioles were losing 10 to nothing. But now I do. Yeah. Because of this video. I mean, that. I thought that was funny. I thought, I thought it was great. I could see BT and Chip Carey doing that kind of right. stuff. They like to have a good time, too. Uh, but it's also a guy that seems a little bit gun shy <laughs> yeah. to be talking about anything negative to do with the Orioles. Yeah, I can't believe you said they're down 10 nothing. That team never loses. I can't believe the color commentator didn't know who Blink-182 was. Who was can't. it? Do we know who that was? Uh, I mean, we can research it. I don't know who does. I mean, mean, how old would you have to be to not know who Blink-182 is? I mean, to be fair, like, I'm not sure I know a ton of Blink-182 either. What? Yeah, but this I mean, I knew those songs that he was singing, to be fair. But, like, I don't know a ton of Blink-182. I don't listen to them that often. Mm. I grew up on them, so Hmm. one of my favorite bands. Uh, Another thing that's trending, Matt Harvey. Remember that guy? He used to pitch for the New York Mets. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight. He was dumped by his model girlfriend because of his new job that he has. He's in commercial real estate. And I guess the source quoted saying, it just didn't make sense overall. He just became obsessed with his new job. Hmm. So obsessed that he had no time for his supermodel girlfriend. How would you approach this, Jamie? Well, uh, one... If she's sad, we should probably give her a hug, okay? She probably needs a little 
love and attention at this point. Yeah. Uh, that guy, she can cry her. Yeah, you have have dry shoulder shoulders, down. right? Yeah. T-bone, yeah, exactly. you do. Big, strong, dry shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how this happens, except for sometimes you take for granted what you've got. Or maybe there was just no real connection. Mm -hmm. Like maybe he thought, hey, she's really attractive and he was into her and then maybe it didn't work out. Maybe the, intellectually they're not the same. Maybe they don't have the same interests. Now he's into this commercial real estate and maybe she's still trying to live the supermodel life and it's just like, you know, oil and water. He's not a starting pitcher anymore. Or that. You would think though. Or that. To be fair, it hasn't been one for quite a while you'd think that he would have less time as a starting pitcher and more time in his new job yeah but here's the thing is his new job is less attractive than his old job true so maybe she's pinning the blame on him for too much time but maybe she's just like i don't want to be with a commercial real estate guy i want to be with a baseball player a rock star or an actor Get the bad rep or the or real estate guys. Board yeah. up for the midday show in yeah, St. Louis. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Do you Those think guys B are studs. Do you yeah, think BK are. and Ferrario can, uh, can swing that to get her on the T Bone dating show? Oh, wow. Yeah. There we go. I mean, anybody with a nickname T Bone, you know they're cool. It uh, gets your foot in the door. Yeah. You know what? Who knows? Maybe she prefers. <laughs> Maybe she prefers the tan man instead. That's unfortunate. <laughs> we'll just tell her there's two different yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, two different people. Uh, last thing here, we talked about him a lot today, but Adam Wainwright going up against Jose Quintana tonight. Mets going up against the Cards. 6.15 on Fox. We talked about Adam Wainwright all day long, but Jose Quintana, what do you think he would look like in this rotation? I know he's 0-4 this year, missed a good chunk of the season, but I feel like it'd be nice to have him in this rotation. He'd look like an ace in this rotation. No, he wouldn't, but he... <laughs> I mean, let's be... In this rotation? No, let's be honest. Look, Zach Thompson, Matthew Miles Lurator. Michaelis has still had a strong season. Uh, he's had... He's been... Uh, he has he been He couldn't start unlucky. game one for us last year in the playoffs. You know who could? Jose Quintana. Jose Quintana. I know. I, I know text on. He got pulled early. He did. he did. And if he was really good, they would have re-signed him. But anyways. Well. No, I think Jose Quintana would be fine in this rotation. My gosh, he'd be helpful. He would have been helpful from the beginning, though. Yeah. They wouldn't have been, but he was hurt, right? So it's all like chicken to the egg thing because would he have gotten hurt if he was here? Who knows? And you know, he did end up hurt, and now he still is 0-4, but... I'd still take him on my team. I know, T-Bone, you're, you're petitioning. I saw you outside with a piece of paper and a pen yeah, uh, out, there, out here yeah. at City Place, and you were petitioning people to sign to trade for Jose Quintana. I saw Bring that. him home. Yeah. Bring him home. I did see yeah, that. Bring him home. He's adopted home from last year. Cardinal. Jose yeah, Quintana. <laughs> <laughs> T-Bone was out there. The flock of geese, they actually traveled across Olive Boulevard just to come over and sign the petition. Why did T-Bone cross the road? Because he needed someone to sign his petition to bring Jose Quintana back home. I, I would go. I would, If the Mets were looking to trade mm -hmm. uh, Jose Quintana, which we had a chance to catch up with uh, Tim Britton yesterday, uh, covers New York Mets for the Athletic. Which, by the way... If you stick around after the show, his interview will be on the um, Instant Replay show. So check that out. And he had some really good stuff. And I asked him specifically, do you think that they will look to move Quintana in the offseason? Because if they were, when his name popped up in trade rumors this year, I think the Cardinals should go get him. Because I think the Mets would eat some of the money. And, like, you're going to have to spend, I think his salary is $13 million. You're going to have to spend $13 million to get a Jose Quintana type pitcher in the offseason to be your number four. Already know what Jose Quintana is. So bring him home. I would entertain it. Bring back Jose. Depending on what the asking price is, I would certainly entertain it. That's it. We're good. That's it on what's trending. All right. We're going to jump back into the St. Louis Blues. T-Bone uncovered a, a cool little article and uh, how it could affect your Blues. And could the Blues benefit from some of the fringe teams having expiring contracts that they have to get rid of? We'll talk about that next here on 101 ESPN.
Jamie Rivers back with you here. I want to talk about my good buddy Stewie from Stewart's American Mortgage Corporation. And uh, whether you uh, are looking to consolidate debt, um, maybe you're looking to refinance your home, uh, maybe you're just looking for a loan in general. How about purchasing a home? Stewie is your guy. And Stewie's got a creation of his own called the Bagel Loan. And the Bagel Loan is their signature loan. And what happens is if you if you borrow $200,000 or more, there are no underwriting fees, no appraisal fees, no title fees, no lender fees, no closing costs. That's an amazing deal. And Stewie also, he's a fountain of information. If there's anything you're looking to ask about, whether it's the Federal Reserve, uh, inflation, whether or not the interest rates are going up, going down, what to, should you refinance, all of these things, Stewie's got you covered. And maybe you're purchasing a home and your realtor has you know, guided you to their lender. Oh, well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But please get a second opinion. Call Stewie real quick on his personal cell phone number, and he will guide you the right way, I promise you. That number is 314-324-4440. Again, that's 314-324-4440. If you missed that number or anything else I said today, you can always Google the bagel loan. NMLS number 226715. It's a fast lane here on 101 ESPN. Jamie Rivers, Andrew Marsh, Tanner Hendrickson in for our guy Anthony Stalter. T-Bone, you brought this into the show today and with an interesting angle on it. There was an article at The Athletic, and it's basically trade targets from fringe teams that could be battling for a playoff spot. Now, yesterday, when we were talking about the Blues season, you talked about how you'd rather be a seller if you're not quite guaranteed to get in the playoffs, try and get some prospects or some draft picks and, you know, continue this retool on the fly. But I think you've had a little bit of a change of attitude today, which I appreciate. Maybe got a good night's sleep, got your milk and cookies, got up, had a good stretch this morning. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, did. Had some coffee, too. Uh, see, Ooh. there you go. So, T-Bone, what's your, what was your angle on this? So I, I saw this article today in The Athletic, and it was talking about the biggest trade chips this year in the 23-24 season. And, you know, I think when we look across the Western Conference and you look kind of at what, what the playoff picture could look like, I think the Pacific, there's four teams that are kind of locks as playoff teams. And you correct me if, if you think I'm wrong here. Vegas Golden Knights, Edmonton Oilers, Seattle Kraken, LA Kings. Mm -hmm. Those four probably locks. And then when I look at the Central, the top three probably are going to be somewhat in this order, Colorado, Dallas, 
and Minnesota. Those are probably the top three in the Central. And that leaves that eighth playoff spot. And this kind of comes to the scenario that we were talking about. The Blues, the Flames, the Jets, the Predators, probably the four that are going to be competing for that spot. Maybe there's somebody I forgot, too. Well, in this list on the Athletic of the best trade chips for 23-24 upcoming season, a lot of those teams that I just men mentioned outside of the Blues have a lot of pieces that are going to be a hot commodity around the trade deadline. With the Winnipeg Jets, you got Mark Schlafly. You've got uh, their goalkeeper, Connor Hellebuck. For the Calgary Flames, it was Noah Hannafin. There was... Uh, Elias Lindholm yeah. was the other one. And then they even threw in here kind of as just kind of a throw in into this section as well to keep an eye on something with the Nashville Predators. Would they be willing to move someone if they're not out of it? What about UC Soros? Would they be willing to listen to offers on him? So I found it interesting because those are the teams that if they're in the same spot that the Blues would be in, then the scenario we played out uh, yesterday where you're kind of on the fringe, you're sitting right around eighth spot, that last wild card, maybe you're a couple points out. And we said, you know, the Blues, unlike last year, where they had the top trade chips, O'Reilly, Tarasenko, Ivan Barbashev, they're going to have probably the second tier market there of Jakub Vrana, Kapanen, and uh, potentially maybe a Scandell if somebody wanted him, or Blay and Sundquist. But these teams have probably the top chips that if they are sitting kind of in that on the fringe of being a playoff team, they may look to sell. And that is something that should probably be in the consideration of the St. Louis Blues, too, if they're in that spot. Yeah, I agree. I think what it does for me is it actually kind of clarifies everything because, to your point, some of the guys you're rhyming off from some of the, the fringe teams, those are like difference maker players. Like Mark Shifley, Connor Hellebuck, Noah Hannafin, Lindholm. Those are guys who are like, woof, that changes your team. I don't know if you can say the same about Verana or Kapanen, Scandella, Sammy Blay. Like, they're good players, but they're kind of accent pieces. Yeah. So if you're the Blues and you're watching Calgary, Nashville, Winnipeg, and maybe some other teams start to liquidate these contracts that they have to get rid of because otherwise they just walk, that might carve the path that you need because they're in essence probably going to get worse and at that point maybe if you're the blues you become a buyer maybe you now you go looking for some pieces at the deadline I was just, i'm glad you just said maybe the blues become a buyer because i was going to ask you what if one of these teams goes the other direction what if calgary says you know what we we know we're going to go through a long period when we lose these guys mm -hmm. let's not trade them let's go full let's pull the angels route Let's go for it. Let's go off the out deadline. For the well, you know, <laughs> it's not going well. Not it's great. But what, what if so, if someone decided to do that? Because, I mean, I thought it was shocking that the Angels decided to be buyers. What if Calgary or Winnipeg says, you know what, this is our last run with Hellebuck. This is our last run with a Hannafin or Lindholm. Mm -hmm. Let's put the foot to the gas and let's go. Let's go buy. Let's go, let's go for it. Let's push all in. Then how does that impact what we're talking about in this scenario, if yeah, at I all? Uh, with Doug Armstrong, I don't think it impacts anything because Army's not a like a reaction guy. Uh, I, I think that Army will have a plan in place at the time, and depending on where they are, if they are if they're inside the bubble, meaning in the playoffs, or if they're just slightly outside the bubble, I think Army will have a plan to probably go acquire something that can give them some depth, uh, add a piece, not not a big significant piece. But I don't think Army's going to panic just because Calgary or Nashville goes out and decides we're adding and they go nuts and they add three, four guys. I don't think Army's going to go, whoa, 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 hang on here. Before this thing's over, before the bell rings, let's go get a high-priced player. Let's go do this. Let's go. we got to keep up to Calgary. we got to keep up to Winnipeg. I don't see Army doing that. Would, would he consider the route that I was saying of if you're on the borderline, but then one of these other teams that's there with you adds that he goes, ooh, I don't want to go do what we just said, what you just said. So do I maybe just sell one piece, maybe two pieces, and then try and gain some assets back in return? That's where I find this yeah. to be so interesting because I think there's a, I think Calgary, uh, Calgary, Winnipeg Jets. I, I think all the those teams. I think they're all kind of right in the same line with the Blues, to where I can look at them and I can go, I can see where you get in the playoffs. Yeah, you can, I can sell also yourself. see where you're kind of mm -hmm. like six to eight points out around trade deadline time. Yeah, I don't think, listen, uh, again, I will I will stand firm on this. If the Blues are in the playoffs, but, you know, hovering around that eighth spot or if they're a ninth spot, and Doug Armstrong is going to get this team in the playoffs. He's going to try to. 
you know, obviously you can't guarantee anything, but Army's going to try and get this team in the playoffs. And what does that look like? Maybe it is selling off one of these pieces that has an expiring contract that you know you probably aren't going to bring back, but then maybe he's going out and buying another piece. Just because you sell off some pieces doesn't mean you can't be buying at the same time. And I think that that's a bit of a misconception. Sometimes people think, well, you're a buyer or a seller. Well, no, you can sell off some of the pieces that will not be back for you the following year, recoup some assets, and you can also go and buy, too. That's one thing that if you look at the decor right now, you got nine defensemen. You know, eight of them under one-way contract. Callie Rosen making 450 in the minors if he goes there. You've got a surplus there. Somebody's always looking for depth on their blue line, especially playoff contending teams are looking for depth. So if Army's looking to add something at the deadline, maybe he, maybe he sells Verona, recoups something, whatever it is, a draft pick or a young player or a, a depth pl player, whatever it is. But then he decides to sell off a defenseman or two and brings in another third-line guy. He's adding. So he's selling off the contracts that he wants to, but he's buying up what he thinks can help him get the team into the playoffs. I just, I just don't see Army just tapping out again. Last year was painful for him. It was painful for the ownership group. Nobody liked it. I, I guarantee Army hasn't slept well all summer because he's ticked off. He did not like missing the playoffs. So I think that Army and the Blues, whether it's selling and buying or just being buyers, depending on their situation, I think they do everything it takes to get in. Yeah, and I could see a scenario where they do both. I, I thought that's what the Cardinals were going to do, frankly. this I think they tried to do that. Had they been the a deadline. little closer, I think they would have. They're way this out past, of it. This past, oh, the Cardinals. Right, the Cardinals. I, I see yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, I thought for sure they would try to do both at the deadline. And I, I think the Blues could be in the same spot to like what you said, where maybe you do look at someone like Avrana who says, you know what, I don't want to resign here. I want to go test the open market. You may look to sell him, but also try and find a way to improve the team, not just for that this year and that run but the run that would be to, for the next season as well and that's what the cardinals i think tried to do but i think they just were unwilling to or they didn't were were unable to find a dance partner to where it was hey we've got this piece we're willing to move but that's about it and that team was like well no no what about that little shiny toy right over there? <laughs> no you do not get that don't touch that no <laughs> That's how Mo said it, too. Uh, and another interesting piece to this, too, is the emergence of some of the younger players. And I'm not talking about Snuggerud and Dvorsky and all that, but Bolduc and Dean, they're going to be available right away in training camp. Who knows if they make it or not? Odds are they're probably going to start in the minors. But, you know, what if they're knocking at the door? What if they're forcing your hand to be brought up to the NHL? Maybe then you're moving on from a Kapanen and a Verana, and your, your replacement is Bolduc and Dean, and then you go pick up a depth piece as well. So yeah. it could look like that. And, and that, too, is why, like, I, I know I came off super negative yesterday. And yeah, I wasn't trying Oof. to come off and say they're sellers right now. Like, no, let the year play out. But in the long run, or the looking at, like, the outlook for the team for the next five years in this retool that they're in, and I don't think that retools are going to take that long, but looking at five years in advance, three years in advance this year, if you're kind of on the fringe, the reason I was saying, hey, just bring in some assets in return for a Kapanum, a Verana is because I think you've got the depth pieces that are in the minor leagues and are coming. I mean, you mentioned Dvorsky, you've got Snuggeru, those guys won't be available, but you will have Dean, you will have Bolduc. If they have really good camps, to your point, it adds to the intrigue of kind of the position the Cardinals are in, where it is, what does this guy look like when we bring him up here? What does Bolduc look like if we put him on the third line or fourth line? What does uh, does Dean look like when he's centering maybe the fourth or third line after the trade deadline? All those kind of questions will be asked if they're sitting right around that fringe of the playoff picture. Tanner Hendrickson, Jamie Rivers, Andrew Marsh. It's the fast lane here on 101 ESPN. We got Beat the Streak coming up next and biggest question of the day.
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Andrew Marsh. It's time for a Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cards looking to bounce back tonight against the New York Mets after losing to the Oakland Athletics last night by a final score of 8 to nothing. Adam Wainwright looking for win number 199. He'll face off against former Cardinal pitcher Jose Quintana. Mets going up against the Cards at Bush. 6-15 first pitch on Fox. If you missed anything from today's show, make sure you go to 101ESPN.com or check out the 101 mobile app. You can find our full show there, as well as our interviews, which included Matt Holiday and Leo Mazzoni. Once again, you can find those on the website or on the mobile app. It's all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. We have beat the streak and biggest question of the day coming up next. I'm Andrew Marsh, and the Sports Center update is brought to you by Silly Gap. Heating and cooling. An independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. They're on top of your game. Their game. Baseballs. All of my successes depend on me. You ready to hit? The hits just keep on coming. And in his first big league hit is a bullet up the middle. It's a fast lane here on 101 ESPN. It's that time of the day. We got beat the streak coming up. We got our guy John back here. John, how we doing? Uh, wonderful. How are you? I'm doing good, buddy. I'm doing good. All right, Marshy, give us the standings here so we can uh, we can get to get to work. Yeah, John is still leading the way, tied with Anthony. Tanner helping Anthony out last night. Both are at four, a streak of four. I'm at one thanks to Taylor Motter going two for four yesterday, and Nolan Arenado could not get the job done for you last night. Jamie, you're back to zero. Yeah, so that's great. Thanks, Marshy. John will go first, then Tanner, then me, then you, Jamie. All right, John. All right. What do you got well, for us, buddy? If uh, if Stalter gets help with T-Bone, I'm gonna I'm gonna call my guy out, my man Eric. He was coming out with this one today, so we're we're going with Jeff McNeil. <laughs> okay, picking a man. All right, I see I see how this goes. Uh, nah, right. loyal. I'm going Brandon Nimmo. Oh wow. Okay, Brandon Nimmo, two Mets so far. Okay, uh, Andrew. Thought maybe I slid that past you. No, no. <laughs> mm. You know, I hate to do it, but I've done it before many times. I'm picking a Met. And unfortunately, I'm picking the worst Met. Oh, the big, big strong, strong guy, guy. <laughs> Pete Alonzo. He's batting 429 against Wayno and seven at bats. So, Pete Alonzo and his hair, I'm picking him. All right, uh, <clears throat> you guys are all uh, scumbags, quite honestly, taking Mets players against the great Adam Wainwright. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. Yeah. I'm going to go with Francisco Lindor. Yeah. Francisco Lindor tonight for me. <laughs> Is that bad? No, all right. I mean, no. hey, we're trying to build streaks here, okay? Hey, it could just be the four hits today, and that's it for Wayno. You know, you, you he may know. not give up any runs, and it could just I'm be these four you, hits. A blue pit, all you I get need. out of the inning. That's all we need. There we go. The blue pit that doesn't find the hole. All right. Marshy, recap it for us. All right. So we have Jeff McNeil. That's John's pick. We have Pete Alonzo. That's my pick. Francisco Lindor is your pick, Jamie. And we have Brandon Nimmo. That's Tanner slash Anthony Stalter's pick. All right, there we go, John. Good luck, buddy. Hopefully we talk to you again tomorrow. I hope so. All right, take care, buddy. All right, that was Beat the Streak. Now it's time for... It's time for the Fast Lane's biggest question of the day. All right, gentlemen, we were just talking about the Blues. We got a question from the 636. Do the Blues have enough grit and character to take on a team like Vegas in the playoffs? Wow. I mean, it's a great question because if nothing else, uh, I think the Blues have lacked some grit over the last couple of years, and uh, they needed to add some. So let's see here. If I go through the lineup, you got 
Braden Shen, that's a no-brainer. Got Torfchenko, who's not afraid to bang out there. Got Jake Neighbors, who's not afraid to mix it up. You got Sammy Blay, who's not afraid to mix it up. Who am I forgetting? Right? Sonny. Sonny, yes. Sonny's willing to go and do that. Sonny's not afraid to get in there. We've seen him go to work. Tucker's got a little of that to him. I don't know if he's in the lineup or not, but nope. if he is. Definitely got Tucker that's got some grit to him. Bortz. Just, yeah, Bortz. I think Justin Falk is a guy, too. He's not afraid to throw his weight around out there. Bennington. Well, do we count him? <laughs> eh, why not? You never know. Uh, you never know if he's going to go after somebody. Never know. So do they have enough grit? Um, and I think here's the thing is, like, I put Bucci in this, too. And it's not because everybody always thinks, oh, you got to be big and, like, in people's faces. Bucci's strong out there. And you look at guys that can wear down the opponent. Like a David Perron was a guy that could wear down the opponent by possessing the puck and forcing them to defend. So as far as grit goes, I think Bucci will block shots, power play, penalty kill, he'll get to the front of the net. Do they have enough? Probably headbutt a guy, according to the 314. He oh, did wow. headbutt a guy. Remember he did, that? yeah. It was a. It was a. Wasn't that like his second game as a blue? It was against uh, the, Coyotes. the Coyotes. It was against the Coyotes. Yeah, maybe that'll be our question tomorrow. Yeah. So for everyone listening, a way to give the remember. answer. Remember, wow. I, uh, I didn't hate it either when he did it. Um, yeah, do they have enough grit? I think they do, but a lot of that's going to depend on you know what what strides Jake Neighbors takes. Torvchenko, does he elevate his game to the next level? Sammy Blade, does he pick up where he left off? Is Oscar Sundquist the version that we remember from before? They have to be relevant guys, right? Like, you can't just have a bunch of fourth liners that are your grit anymore. They have to be relevant players. If you look at Vegas, you know, like a guy like Ivan Barbashev, he's a gritty guy. He was playing on the first line for you. Mark Stone playing on the second line. Like, you've got relevant players that are playing with grit. So I think that's where, uh, you know, that will be determined once the season starts, how those guys go. Braden Shen, I'm not worried about at all. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about him either. I, I do think the one thing that I would kind of highlight, too, is, like, what I would be looking forward to see if they have enough grit because I kind of – I'm on the side of what you said when we started the question of did they have enough last year? Yeah, they probably needed – they definitely needed more. And I think they still could need more. And the spot that I'm going to look at – and you mentioned this earlier in the show. I can't remember when. But – it's the front of the net, not just on the offensive side, but on the defensive side. I don't need, like, Pareko sending guys through the boards like Pronger used to do. But I do need him to be stronger in front of the net. I need the whole defensive core to be stronger in front of the net. Not allowing backdoor tappings, making sure those guys are uncomfortable when they are in that spot. So that would be the thing that I would highlight because, like, I'm not concerned about Shen. I'm not concerned about those fourth line guys bringing the grit. I think they'll bring it. Um, it, It's the defense in front of their own net helping out Jordan Bennington. That's where I want to see more of that grit that we're looking for. So I had an interesting conversation with a guy at the gym the other day of all places. And uh, he's a great dude. Loves to talk hockey. And we were talking about Colton Pareko. And you know he's like, oh, you know, I know Colton Pareko is not going to be like, like Chris Pronger. And then he, he jumped to Alex Petrangelo. And he said, you know, Petro, too, I wanted Petro to be like Pronger. And, you know, he just never had that grit and whatnot. And he, he brought up the the famous, you know, Jamie Benn sitting on Alex Petrangelo, basically, okay? So I paused and I looked at him. I said, okay, let's, let's just hang on a second here. You're right. Neither of those guys possess the same anger or grit that Chris Pronger did. That, but Chris Pronger's one of one. Yeah. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame right in now. In a different era. In a different era. Yeah, exactly. But look at what, what did Alex Petrangelo do this year in the playoffs? One Win thing. the cup. No, one thing. Apart oh. from winning the cup, what's one thing that he did that was like, really? That was Alex Petrangelo who did that? Got suspended, I remember. Yeah. Two-hand chop across Dreisaitl's forearms. Who saw that coming? Not me. Me neither. Well, I get that. He's the villain. So, but what I'm saying is each player can still evolve. Even if they're getting later in their career, a guy like Colton Pareko, I don't know if he has it in him to do a two-hand chop across a guy like Dreisaitl's forearms, but I didn't think Petro would either. So I'm not ready to write off guys like Colton Pareko because they're not Chris Pronger. Chris Pronger is a unicorn, and you know you can't expect that from all of your best defensemen that you have on your team. But anyways, defensemen mature at a different pace than a lot of other players do, and certainly ones who are shutdown guys who play that role uh, sometimes they develop that, that sandpaper a little later on in their career. Hence, Alex Petrangelo doing it last year. Yeah, and, and that's just the biggest thing for me with Prego. He, if, if him 
or Letty or Krug show a little bit more of that sandpaper in front of their own net. I, I said this earlier when we were talking about this. I, Bennington's numbers show he had a bad year. I don't think he had a bad year. I, I, the numbers are skewed because of the defense that was in front of him. I think if that defense shows a little bit more sandpaper in front of their own net, you're going to see those Bennington numbers come up to more of what you're expecting. And, and that's that's how the Blues make the playoffs this year as that 8-7, even a top three team in the Central. I couldn't agree more. All right, that's Tanner Hendrickson, Jamie Rivers, Andrew Marsh. We're going to wrap it up when we come back with what you miss, criticisms, compliments, here on 101 ESPN. here on 101 ESPN. 
Uh, if you missed anything today, you can always download the podcast brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto. We talked with Matt Holiday right off the top. We talked about uh, his boys, how... Uh, how they're thriving and how they communicate and work with each other and continue to get better and better. We talked a little bit of Cardinals with him. We talked about Matthew Libertor. Uh, and if it was you know, the Matthew Libertor we saw last night, is that the real version? Or are we sure what the real version is yet? We also talked about the Blues and which player needs to have a step up or a bounce back year. Uh, we each had our sneaky Super Bowl contenders. You don't want to miss that one. We had some blues cues. We had the great Leo Mazzoni on today. Uh, I urge you, if you missed that, Leo Mazzoni, the former Braves pitching coach, he's a gem. He's a national treasure, and if nothing else, you will be thoroughly entertained while you listen to Leo break down the game. We had the lineup game, which we, uh, we were fine for a while. We stumbled a little bit around the middle of the order, but... We got back on the rails quickly. And, of course, the, the big topic of the day was Adam Wainwright. Now, if things go poorly for Wayno, you know, what do the Cardinals do with him if they choose to send him to the bullpen? Who gets the call into the rotation? If they don't send him to the bullpen, does he get every start from here on out to the end of the season? That will be uh, something the Cardinals have to figure out, and that will be starting tonight. First pitch, 615, your Cardinals versus the New York Mets. Adam Wainwright on the bump for the start tonight, looking to looking to have a better game than he did last time. So that uh, all of that was wrapped into our show today. Marshy, what do you got for criticisms and compliments? Yeah, we got a text from the 636. Tanner said he reads the paper earlier. He should be driving a 95 Buick Le Sabre. Mmm. I guess I'll be more specific moving forward. I read the paper online. Oh, I thought <laughs> you were like, you said to me. I, I pictured you, you in a house coat, slippers, walking out to the driveway. Rocking chair. You pick up your newspaper. You take the elastic off of it. You got your coffee brewing, but it's not like a normal. It's like the, <laughs> the hot water and you pour it in the coffee grounds. <sighs> I can see that. Yeah. I got a real visual on that one there. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an e-paper, an hmm. e-paper. Okay, an electric paper. Yeah, they, they still deliver. They do. Well, they're making still... electric bikes now. Why they not? Do. Yeah, we'll just call it a moped. Uh, from the six three six, you guys are monsters. Good plays though, much better than when Anthony bet Wayno to get like six strikeouts last week. <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> no, <laughs> that was, no, that was on us. It was the FanDuel's fade or follow, and. <laughs> We may have steered our contestant the wrong way. But didn't have to follow us. Poor Rex. The, uh, the the total strikeouts for Adam Wainwright was four. And we went over. We were optimistic. We were team Wayne. Was, was this the one against the Royals? Is this a, is, was that this start? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Mm. I, that one, I can understand that mm -hmm. one a little bit because that Royals team stinks. Do they? Well... Hmm. I know we made them look good, but mm -hmm. they do truly stink. So, so I can understand. Our poor fade or follow guy uh, got <laughs> bounced right away. Thanks to That's Anthony. Tough. It was Anthony's call. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the 314, and earlier we talked about Kevin Brown singing Blink-182, and he was singing I Miss You. 314 wants to know, can we get a T-bone rendition of Where Are You? He sings it so well on the Midday Show. Oh, wow. Yeah. <coughs> Why do you believe it or not? I even did a guest appearance today on BK and Ferrario. Is it a guest appearance when it's your show? Interesting. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Well, I'll call it a guest appearance. Makes it look bigger. That's always important. Where are you? <laughs> that's about all I know. Wow. Okay. I thought that was pretty good. That's it? Yeah. Well, that's all they asked for. Well, we got that. And okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Where are you? I'm so sorry. I don't know if that's how wow. it goes or not. Wow. Not really it. That's okay. Oh. You know what? That's the kids' bop version. <laughs> 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 All right. From uh, 
Thanks, Dad. Fast Lane Tan Man is better than Nooner T Bone. Maybe he's <laughs> the prince that was promised. You know, I don't like the nickname Tan Man. Tan Man. I regret I brought it up yesterday because clearly it's sticking. <laughs> you know that works, right? Nicknames you hate. Usually those are the ones that stick. I'd rather be called like T Drizzle than Tan Man. T Drizzle. You can't call yourself T Drizzle. Why not? Because I said so. Oh, I, I think it's better than Tan Man. <laughs> By the way, uh, I guess I said this Buick wrong. La, what is it? Lay Sabre or no? La Saber. La Saber. There yeah. we go. I even told you. I've never. I already <laughs> forgot. Never I don't know. I forgot. What he said. I don't know. I don't know anything about. I was like, oh my Buick. goodness. Oui, oui. Buick Le Sabre, huh? Whatever. You're French Canadian. I thought you'd maybe get it. I let it ride until this point. Uh, whatever. Uh, thank you, Text Line, for making me feel like an idiot. Uh, from Tanisha, I listened to the BK and Ferrario show er- earlier, and Tanner was called a diva. What? LOL. How do you feel about that, Tan Man? They said I was like someone else cheating on him, you know? Mm. Yeah. Do you regret it, though? No. See, that's... I had a good time. <laughs> I might go back. It was worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. We got one more, Marshy? Yeah, we got one more. From the 314, remember when that person criticized the lineup game earlier this week? What an idiot. Such a great segment. The best. Yeah, you weren't here, T-Bone. We, we had one texter and one only that criticized the lineup game. It's the worst segment we have. And uh, Fastlane Nation went wild. Yeah, I they, can't blame them. They did not like it. They, they, most of them do like the lineup game. They, they like to play along and participate. They certainly like the Sounders when Marshy has new ones and all that stuff. So, anyways, uh, that guy pretty much got roasted the entire time. Well. All right, uh, for Tanner Hendrickson here, uh, T-Bone, thank you so much for helping out yesterday and today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Like I said, I had fun. We got. Uh, Kerry Davis in from 2 to 4.15 tomorrow. And then Josh Outman, former Major League Baseball pitcher, going to get his debut here in the fast lane from 4.15 to 6 o'clock. Again, first pitch for the Cardinals at 6.15 tonight. Adam Wainwright on the bump. Let's all get out there and encourage big Uncle Charlie to get the win tonight. Until tomorrow here in the fast lane, see ya!